I'm Jennifer Page, and you're watching Eclectic Arts Media. I, I hope all my experiences are like this. I mean, I've been blessed thus far with all the projects, especially this one, to have such an amazing time shooting it. I mean, apparently I do darkness and death really well, so I didn't have to tell, I don't tell happy stories yet. When I did the vocals for the, for the chorus of, of the uh, Phantom of the Opera. Hello! <laughs> Hi, Chloe. How are you? I am so good. How are you? I'm doing really good. Someone was just leaving the bar with a beer, and then there was this opening, and I just felt myself climbing onto the bar. <laughs> it feels kind of like a laughing about it last night, a family band in a way, because, yeah. you know, um, and, and that's really exciting as well, because, um, you know, it, it feels a little bit more like home when you're on tour and stuff. I mean, even the thought of it seemed insane, but I thought, yeah, maybe let's give it a go. <laughs> I wanted to look exactly like they looked on the cover with their big perm hair and their chokers and their, like they just look, they were so badass and so cool. It's wild. That stuff really starts to creep up on you. And you're watching Eclectic Arts Media. <laughs> Well, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are in the world. I'm Mark Sugiyama from Eclectic Arts Media based here in Seattle, Washington. And thank you so much for joining me on this Monday, the 8th of April, 2024. And uh, hopefully those, in, at least here in North America, survive the uh, the eclipse. Um, here in Seattle, we didn't get to see much of anything <laughs> because it's our typical gray and showery day. Um, but uh, I would like to thank Leah Ingram for joining me last um, last week. It's always great catching up with Leah, and she first joined me uh, back uh, during the pandemic, during 2020, um, and she's always been a great guest uh, for two talkers, so we tend to, our live streams tend to go pretty long, and she has her own live stream, not live stream, her own podcast that she does now with two of her friends uh, called Honestly Sane. And speaking of which, coming up, the next confirmed live stream interview that I have scheduled is for this Friday at 4.30 p.m. Pacific. Uh, this is a new one for me. Um, I have done um, an interview in person. Goodness, this was back in 2017 um, with a luchador, uh, which is a lucha libre Mexican wrestling. And so I have Halcom Negro scheduled to join me. Um, and I first saw him wrestle, I think that was 2017, actually. And he's been working his way up through the independence. And um, uh, it's going to be really fascinating to get a chance to talk to somebody um, in that entertainment world. I'm not the like a hardcore wrestling fan. I kind of go in and out with wrestling, but I've um, always had a, a deep uh, respect. I shouldn't say always, but since I started getting into wrestling, I've had a, a respect for uh, what they do, um, the entertainment value, and also just the, the punishment they put their bodies through uh, to entertain the fans. So he's scheduled to join me at 4.30 this Friday. And the next week, I'm, I'm hoping that maybe even during this live stream, I'll get a confirmation about another guest that uh, uh, will be coming on that's from... Uh, genre or an area that a lot of people have been asking me about when am I going to go back to this and I'm like well I'm kind of feeling things out and I've had a lot of musicians on this year which has been awesome because of me being a musician and then um, I had Kayla Reese who's a professional boxer world champion boxer and also an actor um, who was in True Detective uh, Night Country from HBO Max little plug there and uh, so uh, I'm always trying to make sure that I cover a lot of different areas uh, with what I do I never want to be pigeonholed into one thing and uh, so if this is your first time joining me on my YouTube channel, if you can do me a huge favor, please hit the subscribe button as well as the notification bell. And if you're over on the Twitch side of things, uh, please follow me over there. And uh, please be aware that if you'd like to ask uh, my guests at any time a question or a comment, you can just join one of those two platforms and put your uh, just join the chat and put your question or comment in there. And um, I'll try to at least read it or you know see what's going on with what you have to say. And then um, if you'd like to know more what I have coming up for anything with the media outlet, 
Uh, please follow me as Eclectic Arts Media, one word on Instagram. That's where I post everything first. And then some of that information migrates over to other social media platforms. So, yeah, I'm really looking forward to today. Uh, I know it's Monday for everybody, so sometimes it's kind of a slow start because it's the beginning of uh, many people's work week. This is the end of my work week, so I'm all kind of happy about it. And I have a show to go to tomorrow night, uh, which I'm also looking forward to. Maybe that'll actually come up during this uh, this live stream. But let's get to things. I think I've talked long enough. All right. Uh, my guest today first joined me on the Alice virtual tour in 2020. He then returned in 2021. He also participated in a handful of fun table sessions. He is a musician under the banner of One Drummer Drumming, and he is currently the drummer for Red Hot Empty. He is also the owner of Shooting Star Skydiving Gear Superstore. Please welcome back to the Eclectic Arts Media Virtual Studio, Mr. Mike Cruel. Yo. Hey, Mike, how are you? Awesome. Yes, and I too survived the eclipse. So um, uh, happy about that. I didn't get to see it today. I was doing other stuff, but uh, I survived it. So we're here. This is awesome. Yeah, this is great. We're, we're both here. We both survived it. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, there's a coworker that I used to see when I would say, hey, good morning. She always said, uh, and I said, how are you doing? I said, I'm alive. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And I was yes. like, she was like 15 years younger than me. I'm like, why do you always say that? <laughs> are, you, are you like kind of negative or something? <laughs> yeah. Just getting to the uh, basics. I'm yeah. Here. <laughs> but um, yeah, for those people that, uh, you know, enjoy, I, we were talking about this pre-show that people you know really, sometimes they really, really hone in and focus in on when is the next eclipse. They really want to travel to it and make sure they see it in its full glory. Um, yeah. You know, eye protection, of course. And everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and then you have other people that are just kind of like, you know, I, it's great and whatever, but um, kind of doing stuff over here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was telling you before, but, you know, I had one year, it came straight over Georgia, you know, six, seven years ago. And that was one year with my boys. We were out camping and we got to see that. But um, other than that, it's been <laughs> whatever. But that was like the one time. So that was cool. Anyway. Yeah. And it, uh, it also makes sense that you had something planned around it. Um, yeah, yeah. So it wasn't just that. And you went back home. It's like, well, no, we're camping. We're doing other things. Yeah. Um, so. so that I, that I can ask. Plus, it's, a, it's, it's family time. You know, I oh, yeah. Too. At, yeah. least your, at least your thing makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. some of these other people that, you know, left their job today <laughs> to go wherever, you know, like, okay. Um, yeah. But, you know, oh. if, if you're a science person and you're whatever, again, you know, whatever floats your boat. <laughs> Absolutely. It's all good. Uh, yeah, but let's, I have so many different things because it's been such a such a long time since we've actually done one of these. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. I know mean, you've, you've been busy. That's for, that's for damn sure. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, and you've been busy uh, with other new things. So I guess yeah. probably the first thing I'd like to start with is uh, with Red Hot Empty. Um, and so we saw a little clip from the music video you guys did. And yeah. but what I'm kind of curious about, because I was looking at another interview, um, was how did how did they find you? Yeah, so I think the last time that me and you, you know, really talked about this type of stuff, I I was talking about how uh, I really enjoyed just being in the studio, not having to worry about <laughs> scheduling a band practice and going out and trying to figure out, you know, shows and doing all that again. Um, but then I think a few months later, so this would have been, you know, uh, early in 2021, um, they lost their drummer. Um, I really, I, again, I was not looking at all. And they just found me on um, Instagram or Facebook as a drummer in Ackworth, you know, through the one drummer drumming. Um, and it was just a total, you know, cold call or DM where he would, the, the guitarist and the guy that writes the majority of the music was like, Hey, are you looking for a band? <laughs> uh, because we just lost our drummer and I like, you know, I'm like what I'm hearing and here's what we're doing. And, um, pretty quickly, uh, they were, um, called the Wilcox wing. Uh, oh man, they were called something else. Wilcox Wing experience or something like that. Anyway, so, um, you know, I listened to it and I was like, oh, this would be fun. So, um, yeah, that's how that started. And it was just a total, you know, I wasn't looking, but they were, they found me and uh, it's, we just immediately hit it off after our first jam. Oh, cool. It's, it's also interesting too that um, like knowing your background and kind of some of the music that you tend to like and the, my, the music that they do, that's yeah. like, that's <laughs> just that's yeah. interesting. <laughs> No, it, you know, yeah. In fact, it was like, as soon as I heard it, I'm like, oh man, this is just like an extension of like, you know, 
uh, what I was doing in Seattle when I was in bands. And this was like, I mean, yeah, it was, I mean, just from when he played me the music, I'm like, there couldn't have been a better band to call me and contact me because there had been some other things that I wasn't interested, you know, a lot of, oh, you know, cover band type stuff. And uh, it just doesn't float my boat. And, um, it, you know, so there were a couple of things that came up before that and after that, but this was like, it was all original. It was all uh, that type of punk garage rock prog mixture of you know uh energy that uh i was all about so yeah i was i was happy and it all worked out with my schedule and i made it work so yeah it was good and it's been good since then so we i mean we hit the ground running with that band so yeah that's i mean that's really cool because it could have been that you know they, they reached out to you and then you got a chance to listen to some of the music and you're like oh yeah no <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> yeah uh, it was, yeah, it was good from the get go. And even like, you know, I actually, when I listened to it, I'm like, well, this is cool. And, you know, I thought it'd be great, but man, you know, what I was listening to was stuff they had written like three, four years ago and all the, you know, as soon as they came in, they played some of that and then some of the new stuff. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> this is even like above and beyond what I thought. And uh, yeah, Ben Barron, who's the kind of the mastermind behind this, he's, uh, I mean, he just pours out music and uh ideas and um so it's been that's what i love that you know the collaboration that working on something and um and everyone being into it and we've had since that time we've had the same members and um yeah it's been cool i mean and we got to we've put out what two album one full album one ep a few singles and we're working in fact today i was ben was here we were mixing a couple more singles that we've recorded for release for another album so i mean it's it's an active active thing um and it got me into the atlanta scene which i had you know kind of been on the peripherals just you know <laughs> a show here or there i wasn't really but um but now i got to see that atlanta's really got an active scene at least for the genre we're in i mean there's a good you know 50 60 70 bands in the same type of genre that are out there you know playing shows uh you know every day of the week, really. Um, so it's pretty active scene, which is awesome. Uh, that's great. Uh, and like you mentioned, so uh, uh, Ben's a member. Who are the other two members of the band? So then Sarah, she's the singer. And then um, Larry, he's bass player. So it's just a four piece. And um, uh, I actually, I have one other, I have a couple of their projects, but there's a project I actually started with the singer and her boyfriend, um, who's a cello player and uh we're starting this other project that's just kind of on the side right now it's kind of a electronic uh just bass uh uh or not bass just drums singer and uh keyboard with loops and stuff like that so um but yeah red hot empty that's just the four of us so um yeah and she's got this great voice you know with where she can you know scream and belt it out but then you know she's melodic too at the same time um and you know larry you know whatever larry's got some you know the great bass lines he'd helped write this new song that we're doing but it's just it's a lot of energy high energy um uh and you know uh the shows are fun just because i don't know that like there's still that energy where uh we go to these some of these shows and the uh you know the kids are just you know <laughs> The crowds are cool. I mean, they're they're just they're really into it. Um, and the lyrics that Sarah's write um, are really, you know, current issues, stuff that's affecting her and, you know, the world out there. So it really connects with a lot of people. Um, so that's awesome. I, that's one of the things that I've loved in all the bands that I've been in. We've always had a you know singer that's conscientious inches or whatever and um, just writing some heartfelt lyrics. And um, so that's another thing i've seen you know we have people come up to us and you know just about what the songs are about and how it's helped them and that type of stuff and you gotta love that so yeah that's amazing i mean when your music affects somebody that much um and you know particularly if it's going to be the lyrics as well that they're like really really connecting with what you're doing that's yeah. really you can't get any higher praise really right no absolutely yeah so um yeah it's it's fun it's uh uh it's a lot of work but it's fun and yeah that i'm loving that one so okay and I, i'm kind of thinking too that uh you know when they reached out to you and then you joined the band that 
um, they, well, I mean, if he was looking at your website, then he probably realized what you're kind of involved with. I mean, with your own studio and a lot of recording the videos that you do that they got a drummer that's got a big skill set besides just the drums. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely it, that, I think that helped us get a, get recorded and get new music out there faster because we did, I mean, we recorded everything here. Um, uh, the first album we did some you know after our first show we really lucked out we had this local label analog revolution that um signed us per se you know they wanted to release all our stuff and uh after the first album um uh we did we redid the bass and the vocals at their small studio up in lj georgia um, but then ever since then we've done everything here we've kind of figured it out um and uh so yeah, I mean, having this here um, and able to just, you know, like the last practice we did, we, re we recorded one song plus we jammed. I mean, we, you know, we worked on some stuff. So it's, it's you know, the mics are always set up here. Um, I've got one set that, uh, I always have at least one set that's fully mic'd up. You know, I have three or four sets, but one that's always mic'd up. So anytime we're playing, if something's going on and we want to lay something down, we can easily just, you know, get something recorded. So, um, yeah, that's been awesome. And then Ben, who is, you know, he has some mixing experience. Um, we were sending stuff out to have mixed and master, but now we're doing all that in house too, because he's really taken that on um, and teaching me a lot of stuff. So we're actually even, you know, mixing and mastering all the way to where we, you know, distribute it. So um, yeah, that keeps it in house, which is awesome. Yeah, you're and you're cheap. Good. <laughs> <laughs> just my time and uh, yeah their time and you know i've got all the stuff so yeah it keeps costs down which is you know you know how that can get with studios and mixing engineer mastering engineers all that stuff yeah and with you know playing the you know playing punk music it needs to be diy on some level exactly <laughs> yeah come it's on, a little too polished you're like okay come on yeah come on <laughs> <laughs> what the hell is this yeah. He's on screen. I think you've got some people here that are fans. Are people oh, there's me now. Scotty Johnson. So I went to um, uh, I went to a drum camp with him in uh, Folsom, California, um, probably like three years ago, two three years ago. And um, yeah, he's awesome. We've kept in touch. He's a drummer. He's up in Texas or down in Texas. And uh, oh, Sam Wright. So he he's in Atlanta scene, man. He's at all our shows. He's a freaking rock and drummer too. He's a uh, he's awesome too. So, um, yeah, it's been good. There's a drummer community. I mean, drummers, you know, I know for, in all things, you know, you find your, your family and your what have you, but the drummer support around Atlanta has been awesome. And just, you know, everyone that I've met online, you know, always very supportive. It's pretty rare. You get someone like, you know, the hell beat is that? What the hell are you doing? You know what you're doing? It's all very supportive. So, yeah. That, that, that makes it that much better. You know, yeah. when you're, obviously when you're, creating and if you're a musician or an artist of any type you put it out there it's always like you know you might say f you to everybody but inside <laughs> you're, you're kind of like you like it yeah exactly <laughs> I, I want you to like it <laughs> yeah yeah um, oh my gosh I, i've definitely been there before <laughs> with some of the stuff you just you put on a certain front but yeah so deep down you're like man i want to put this shit out because i want people to dig it that's why yeah I'm yeah it out. yeah um and so it's great because you have the support um you, you found like uh, some kindred spirits with the bandmates that you have there sounds yeah. like and um and you're doing like you say you're learning things doing stuff in house you're learning from some of your bandmates with what the skill sets they have it's kind of branching you off into like another side project um yeah i mean it. just yeah just the band itself i mean to step back a little bit what you're saying like the band it's it's an interesting band in that um we almost could be called generation or whatever we've got uh someone you know we got 20s 30s and 40s that's how we started off right now we're 30s, 40s, and 50s now that I've crossed the line. Uh, but it's like this, you know, but it doesn't seem like that. You know, music just, you know, brings that. But just being in the scene, that's also created um, a bunch of stuff with uh, other bands that we we play a lot with. Um, and people seeing me out there and knowing what I do, I'm helping out other bands with drum tracks and stuff like that because uh, they're looking for drummers or what have you. So um, that's gotten me some other um jobs but also opened up other opportunities and stuff like that within the scene um you know it seems like at least in atlanta you know every drummer's in like three or four bands or what have you but um uh but it really is it's a, it's a 
it's a pretty it's a bustling scene and it's just it's great to see the uh the support between the bands even um which has been awesome yeah that's it's very very cool and i'm thinking of uh when you're talking about um the opportunities and things that kind of come your way there is a a, a friend that i have up here that was looking to, this is probably maybe three years ago he was looking to get into like merchandising for bands and them, uh, especially yeah. on the local level and i told him well, the first thing and he's a musician he's in a band himself so i'm like first thing you gotta do you gotta get into the scene you gotta get out there and be at shows yeah uh, you can't yeah. do this from a computer <laughs> you, right you gotta, no. you gotta get out there and yeah. mix it up with people and they'll get to know who you are and maybe the band will play with other bands and all that kind of stuff and then you can tell them about what you're doing um and that yeah, he's been out there he's been shooting, he's been photographing shows you know all that kind of stuff yeah and, and um it's been it's been really interesting to watch his his career just kind of his, it's basically his company at this point just kind of blossom but yeah, I said, man, you can't be, um, you know, a keyboard warrior. You can't be right. on the fr on fringe of a scene. You got to be in the mix of that scene. Yeah. Um, and because everyone's going to ask, like, do you know this person? Have you talked to them? Have you done business with them? Um, yeah. And if it, and they all start saying good things. They, they start saying to all, to all the friends, hey, I need t-shirts. Talk to this guy. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, and that's just the you know the beauty when a scene works. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, there is not a single drum tracking gig per se that I've gotten that wasn't someone word of mouth, you know, for all the, for all the crap I put out there on, you know, Instagram and YouTube and, you know, website and whatever, um, besides, you know, I guess maybe cold call from red hot MT, everything else has always been, you know, Oh, Hey, I saw Mike play there or, um, Hey, I know Mike from him from here, whatever. Um, so all of that has been word of mouth and it's more so now that I'm in the scene instead of just, you know, when we talked, you know, three, four years ago, originally, uh, when I finished out the studio, I was like, I'm just happy in the studio. I'm going to make solo albums, you know, I'm good with that. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll get some drum tracking gigs, but really most of that comes from actually being in the scene now, um, and getting to know all these different bands and members and stuff going on. So, um, yeah, hundred percent. That's obviously yeah, the way to network and all that stuff. So, yeah, and I can understand both sides of it. So, like you said, you know, three years ago or even four, four years ago when we, when we first talked, that you know, you're building up a studio and everything like that. And you're kind of like, I'm just, I want to be able to create and kind yeah. of do this is where, where my head's at right now. And then yeah. this opportunity came from out of nowhere, really. Yeah. And now you're, you're doing both. Yeah. <laughs> so. No, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we, that actually, you know, um, I think the last time we talked, I was just releasing that G Town Sound, which was like my first solo album, you know, uh, kind of showcasing the sound of the studio and what I was doing at the time. Um, and I was still, and I was also starting to work on my next album. Um, and I mean, I got deep into that. And it was in the middle of that second album when Red Hot Empty, you know, popped into my life and uh, kind of blew my mind a little bit. And that second album sat for a good year and a half. Um, until we had we had put out some stuff and then I got back to it. But yeah, then it's like every time I come down to the studio, there's something to do now, you know, where it wasn't just coming down to create, which I love that. Um, but now it's like, hey, am I coming down to work on Red Hot Empty? Do I have a drum tracking gig I need to work on? Do I have, um, you know, do I want to work on my solo album? Do I just want to practice and play? You know, um, it's definitely opened up a lot of different opportunities. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I have uh, that G Town sound on CD because I remember I bought it. Yeah, yeah, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I try to support the people that I that I interview. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I can yeah. save a couple bucks together. <laughs> <laughs> Little Bandcamp Friday thing. So yeah, but it's I I think what's really really um, admirable is that you've been staying after it. So I mean, you have been putting out a ton of music either if it's your own if it's with uh, red hot empty um playing shows and for me being the way i am since i and you kind of know so we we're talking about this pre-show that um you know i try to grind as hard as i can and yeah. that's I mean if you don't do it no one else is going to do it so it's kind of like you know, I'm, I'm completely freelance so it's like yeah I'm, I, like you said when i come to the studio i don't know if i'm gonna be working on this this or this and that's exciting um, yeah when you have all these different options kind of going on Absolutely. You know, I joke about it a little bit with, you know, with my kids who are now in college, but I'm like, you know, my runway is shortening, you know, <laughs> with our lives. Right. So I've got this limited amount of runway left to get all the, you know, to do as much as I can. 
Um, and I really feel like, but I've always been like that, whether it was, you know, back in Seattle or when shooting stars started, or when I was in the newspaper business, I mean, I've always been a workaholic per se. I love what I do for sure, but I definitely, um, but part of it is, you know, definitely like, you know, there's, there's only so many years <laughs> left, but I, I, I'm definitely, I love learning, putting out as much stuff as I can. And, um, it just snowballs and there's no really, there's plenty of time to do it. I mean, um, my wife, my, you know, my wife has a full-time job, so we spend our weekends. That's our, most of our, you know, evenings and together, you know, weekends are together time during the week. You know, I do have that other job. <laughs> I have shooting star, but, um, that, business has been around for uh almost 25 years now and um uh it pretty much runs itself when things are going well which it has been for the last couple of years so that's allowed me time to do all of this during the week i you know i it's a lot of uh internet stuff where i go in once a week and make sure everything's going all right um but that allows me to pursue this um for sure and this is to me this is kind of like my you know, my next career per se, you know, I'd love to see this take off. It is, it doesn't make any money right now, but it get to a point where it could somewhat support me at some level and be able to like bring down shooting star a little bit or whatever, sell that to someone or do something different. Um, so yeah, I think that's part of the inspiration of, you know, wanting to keep after it other than I just enjoy <laughs> playing drums, I enjoy making music. Uh, there's, yeah, there's, you know, I see, I see pictures uh, that people take at shows and stuff. And, you know, I don't have a bigger smile than when I'm sitting there with my bandmates or playing or drumming or what have you, you know, it's the same as being with my family. I mean, those two things, I mean, that's like, those are gold. So, um, yeah. Well, first, uh, congratulations on having a company for almost 25 years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And through a pandemic, I, yeah, that's, to me, that's the most. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely. Thank you. Yeah, it's. Uh, it's good. It's a lot of heartache and hard work and all that stuff. But um, surviving the pandemic was the hardest thing. And once we got through that, then I'm like, we're good for as long as we want to run it now. So. That's that's awesome. I know at least up here, I've seen businesses that, um, you know, they're doing everything they could to deal with the pandemic. And then what happened is that um, when they came out to like say 2021, 2022, they're just kind of burnt out you know, stressed out yeah. financially, they might be in debt more. And so they're looking to sell. There's been a lot of business on the breweries around here. They've changed yeah. hands to somebody else because they're like, you know what? We gave it the college try and we hung in there as long as it could, but that thing just kind of took the life out of us. Yeah. Uh, and so when other businesses have also felt that, but decided to keep on going into 2023, 2024, um, it's like, yeah, I, I kind of lost track of that. Cause like for any, standard person out there once things were opening up around here it's just like okay now i can go back to that restaurant I go back to that venue i can go back to this and like you know some of it's not better. there like, i'm done <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah we we you know me and my wife we were on the edge a couple times i mean um during the pandemic and trying to figure out but my wife is awesome i mean she she really helped me through that time um and she was a big part of shooting star for several years now she's kind of doing her own thing but we were quick on our feet. We downsized. I mean, at the entering into the pandemic or getting close to that, I mean, we had a skate park as part of, we were kind of branching out into like this, or we had branch out to include skateboarding and selling skate goods. And we had a skate park. And as this came in, we made a, a pretty quick shift. It was like, Hey, we need to downsize, get through this. And um, so we were able to keep all the employees, but we definitely downsized what we were doing um, and uh, and kind of were quick on our feet to like cut costs as fast as possible and make it work. Um, and now coming out of it, we've been stronger. Um, you know, the, obviously the employees that stuck with us and we stuck with them, they've, you know, obviously been loyal, like, hey, you got us through this. And uh, we have, you know, they've stuck with us through that, which has been great. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, I mean, again, I, 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 I've not been on the business end of that side of things in terms of like what that must have been like trying to like downsize and can we hang on to our employees? Do we have to lay off some people or what do we have to do? Yeah. Um, and so it's just when, yeah, so it's like you're, you're in the trenches and you yeah. came out of you came out of it. So it's like, yeah, that's yeah. Gonna, that's that's a different type of loyalty for sure. Yeah, for sure. 
yeah um yeah i thank them <laughs> every day <laughs> that they're here it gives me the opportunity to do this which i truly love so yeah, I mean, and for people out there that aren't familiar, uh, Mike and I went to the same high school together. Um, I wouldn't say that we knew each other really well back then. We were in the same circles, the so same kind of friends and that kind of thing. Um, but it wasn't like we we're, you know, BFFs or something like that. <laughs> like right. I know all, yeah. all, your, all your little secrets and dreams and hopes and you know, that <laughs> yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, but we definitely you know, are at the same places on a Friday or Saturday night kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, and so you were drumming, you know, for such a long time since I've known you. And you are, are kind of a loose, I don't want to be an ageist or anything, but I think I'm older than you. Uh, <laughs> how, how, how are you holding up? Because the drums are such a physical instrument. Are you having like wrist problems or your forearm issues or anything like that? So, um, you know, I started on some of, there's a couple, there's a couple Red Hot Empty songs where it takes the, it takes everything that I've got, especially in the middle of a show in a hot, you know, bar or hot venue or what have you um and uh it took me a while to get that you know getting chops back and working on that and um that's a different thing you know right just doing that in the studio and doing all that but in a live setting and stuff like that um and yeah uh what i've started doing is um my sons have <laughs> helped me they're both in gymnastics and they both you know do all kinds of weightlifting i hated weightlifting i hated that type of exercise in uh, high school, I think we've talked about that a long time ago that I used to I was part of a one of my classes was weightlifting at Lake Washington and I would check in and then go to the music uh, band room and I had my drum set up in one of those you know little studios and I'd play and then that was all I did all semester long and I still got a grade because you know you I don't know the guy wasn't watching it didn't matter but I hated weightlifting and you know I got into running but I, I but anyway long story short my sons have started showing me um, some different arm exercises. So every day I do those, um, and I just play longer. Um, I go through the, you know, I, I think the, the breaking point was probably about a year ago with Red Hot Empty. A few of our songs were getting heavier and harder and a little bit, uh, you know, they would be at the end of the set and I could feel myself like, <laughs> how am I going to get through this? And I would get through it, but I mean, I was spent, just spent. Um, and so I started building up that um, stamina with uh, making sure like during the week I'd, I'd run through the set a few times, especially those those songs. Um, but then those exercises that I uh, one of my sons, Jamie, showed me. Um, so I'm doing some more forearm and arm exercises and stuff. And I'm a hard hitter. Like I'm not, you know, yeah, I can finesse and stuff like that. But with this band and, you know, with my energy, I, I hit hard. It just that's who I am and that's I, I wouldn't have it any the other way <laughs> and so I'm a physical I'm physical when it comes to drums and um uh but yeah now I'm I feel strong through our sets and stuff like that but it did it was about a year ago I was like a wake-up call like dude if you're gonna do this you've got to you know build this back up and you know you know and be able to get through where you're strong all the way through not just barely holding on to the end so well I appreciate your honesty yeah um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh i feel strong now but yeah it it definitely there was there was a good six months we'd have some shows and i'm like hey can we put this song like there <laughs> because i'm good there not there uh, you know but now you know uh i feel much stronger um you know we'll see over the next few years but the exercise the weightlifting, the arm exercises and uh, barbells and dumbbells that's what i've been doing mainly upper body uh, my feet and are just fine i mean it's funny from all my running i can play bass drum and hi-hat all day long but uh it's definitely the arms that wear me out or did get me almost <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah i was, I, I was going to show this um you know from the uh the overlay i mean that picture of you i mean <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah i mean it's uh that's that's pretty much my face and energy <laughs> the whole show. I mean, I just I mean I'm all in. I mean it's it's fun and um, you know I'm not I'm not blasting the other members away or doing you know where it's like it's the Mike Gruel show, but uh, it's definitely energetic and that's the music we play and um, you know so yeah you know, and you you have to go for it. I mean yeah. I, if I if you guys are up here in Seattle playing a set at you know El Corazon or something, yeah. I don't want to see a punk band just kind of 
exactly. <laughs> the, the drummer just kind of it's like what yeah. the fuck's going on here? <laughs> exactly you know if you're not gonna go for it get the hell off the stage yeah so uh yeah it's funny i i um uh I, I don't know what it is. It's just, you know, I've had a couple, I, you know, I was talking about Scotty Johnson. He was in here a little bit ago, he went to drum camp and, and uh, of course I get on the drums at the drum camp and, you know, we're playing some stuff and I just like, I'm just big, you know, their song came on. We were supposed to play. It was one of these nights and we, I played to some living color or something. And I just like, man, I was just bashing the bass drum and the guy stops like, dude, I just put new heads on there. I'm like, okay, okay. But it's just, it's just my, you know, when I when I hear a certain song or do go for something, that's hard for me to hold back. So. Yeah, I I remember, I remember there's a, a little story from KK Downing from when he used to be with Judas Priest. You know, one of, actually one of the founding members of Judas, and I think they were recording the Sin After Sin album. And the producer um, Roger Glover from Deep Purple was like, as soon as he hit the record button. Um, KK down and started doing all these shakes like he was on stage and he's like he stopped the recording it's like what are you doing we know we're, we're recording in the studio and he's like when I'm plugged in I'm plugged in and I can't I can't play any other way this is what I do yeah uh, it's like every take that's how he was yeah. uh, and I and I totally you know respect that type of thing because I think it also comes across not only in your performance but in, in KK's case it comes through in the recording yeah um, and that's how he is no it's funny you know there's times you know um I had one particular Red Hot Empty song that I was recording and it was a burner and I was having a heck of a time just like getting it right and I'm sweating and stuff like and so I'm like man what you know it just I spent like three or four hours and I mean there's no air conditioning in the studio that's one thing I need but <laughs> but uh in her basement whatever but I mean I was dying so I was like so I turned down the lights, I ripped off my shirt. I'm like, I'm just getting this. I'm like, I'm I'm gonna get this. And it was finally after that, I'm like dripping in sweat, my shirt's off. I'm like, that's the take right there. That's the take. <laughs> someone walked in, they were like, what the hell? Are you playing for someone? I'm like, no, I'm just trying to get good sound. <laughs> good energy. Is, is there video of that? No. <laughs> yeah, I have cameras up everywhere, but no, I didn't have video up for that one. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's a that's awesome though. Again, you know, you're like you're bound in terms. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna get this fucking track. I'm gonna right. make it. Yeah, exactly. You're I'm, not I'm, gonna beat me. Yeah, I'm oh, not leaving God. here until I get this track. Yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness. Uh, and and Scotty's still with us, and he actually asked a couple of minutes ago about um wanted to know how much do you run because he said when you're in California, you're like running every morning. Yeah, so um it's definitely slowed down. So my dog Presley, um she had a couple leg issues and she was my running or is my running partner. She's eventually, she just got starting getting back. Um, and, uh, she had two ACL <laughs> surgeries probably cause I ran her so freaking much, but, um, she's back a hundred percent. So, um, I'm just starting to, I, you know, I walk them every day. I've got, we've got another dog now, uh, Basil and I'm getting her up to speed. She's just about to turn one. Um, but yeah, when I was in California at that time, and we've talked about it, I'm an ultra runner, I'm doing 50 Ks and 100 Ks and stuff like that. So uh, when I was in California, I was running, you know, six, 10 miles in the morning before we went to the studio. Um, I'd run to breakfast three or four miles and run back and then we'd jam out all day. But uh, I'm back to running about twice a week, uh, about three to six miles. And then I'm, I walk the dogs every day, about two miles. Um, but I want to get back up to my where I'm doing, you know, 10 to 20 miles a week. Um, I'm just starting, I took Basil, I got her, her first 10 K in the trails up here in Kennesaw mountain. Um, I mean, <laughs> and she's just, she loves it just like Presley. So we're both out there. Um, I meant to go out like four miles and I realized after a while, I'm like, Oh my gosh, <laughs> I'm going to be out here a little longer. So she got her first 10 K. Um, but yeah, uh, I love running. It clears your head, clears my head. Um, usually I run with nothing, listening to nothing. It's really just a time to clear my head. Ideas, tons of ideas. The idea for one drummer drumming came up from a run, you know, it, it was Mike's drum tracking originally or whatever. And then, uh, I was looking for something that whatever, didn't have my name in it. And, um, and yeah, the odd and one drummer, anyway, a lot of those ideas, a lot of song ideas, drum ideas, life ideas come through just running and clearing my head tons of business ideas that's that's amazing i, I know that when we were talking about uh your, your ultra running and that type of thing that 
even hearing it right now, it just makes me tired. I mean, <laughs> just hearing that, like, holy 50K, 100K. It's like, that's why people drive. They don't run that. Yeah, yeah. It's a, yeah, it's a long day. <laughs> you're in the woods all day or you're, you know, the one we talked about, you know, I ran from Kennesaw Mountain to Stone Mountain. I've done that every year except for like the last year. And that, uh, that's just awesome. I just love being on the roads, running through downtown Atlanta. Um, yeah, I don't know. There's something about it, whether it's street or trails, just being out there running with me or me and my dog. That's, that's another one of those, like, I don't know, life things. That's, no, that's again, um, it, like you said earlier, like the interest you have, you really, you really go into the, your interest. If it's, you know, skydiving, if it's running, if it's music, if it's like, you don't just kind of do it in small measure. You're like, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> I suppose so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The ultra thing is kind of funny. I mean, and that was, we talked about before, but I went from doing 10 Ks to a hundred K it just because I had a friend who was doing, I'm like, Hey, I want to run with you. Let's do it. And yeah, I killed myself, but then, you know, I kept it up and it's been fun since then. So. Have you ever had any, I um, mean, hopefully not, but, I'm thinking like I know some people that are um, hardcore cyclists up here and yeah. almost every one of them's had some sort of running with a car or some kind of you know, hopefully a minor yeah. accident. <laughs> Have you had anything as a runner? Um, you know, nothing. It's more annoying. I haven't had any close calls. I mean, I do run on some busy streets. Um, I'm always worried with my dogs and stuff like that. But, you know, whatever. I It hasn't happened and I hope it doesn't. I'm pretty, you know, pretty I stay pretty aware, especially because I don't wear I usually not listening to music, so I'm hearing stuff, especially when I'm on the roads. Um, but no, more annoying where someone like, you know, they, you know, pull up to a light right in front of you and you're like, okay, guy, right, whatever. Uh, that type of stuff where, you know, those, they're not watching, um, but I'm watching them, so it's all good. Okay, just being a defensive runner. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> defensive runner. I like that, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I see uh, Sam right down in Atlanta saying, "I'm not running unless the cops are chasing me." <laughs> <laughs> I'll run with you then too. So, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, this reminds. Yeah, we just had a house show. We did a house show, uh, and the cops showed up. And I was like, "Oh, good grief, <laughs> is this happening?" Uh, but they didn't do anything. They they left. But it was, you know, one of those things where, like, uh, okay, great. <laughs> well, I, 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 if I was in a band at a house show and the, and the cops showed up, I mean, we're a real band now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Especially, especially a punk band. <laughs> oh yeah, that, yeah. The place was packed. We were, uh, we just didn't know how that was going to go down. It was like, oh my gosh. There's a couple places like that. And I'm sure there is down in Seattle too, but in Atlanta we have two or three that these, you know, people. And they're they're part of a band or whatever. But they've really gutted the house and they've made it into an outdoor area and an indoor area. I mean, it's a full on in a neighborhood, um, and they've pretty much kept the peace. <laughs> Every once in a while, something goes, and that's where we're like, oh, good grief, because you're down in the basement and the, the whole house is packed and people in the backyard, and you're like, okay. Um, but some pretty cool stuff. I mean, as far as like the scene and the number of people that come to these shows, that's awesome. Yeah, uh, for me, I'm thinking, um, so I'm a huge Cancer Slug fan, and Alex's okay. band started from, definitely from DIY punk roots, and he's, all of his influences are that, um, and a lot of those early shows that he had uh, videotaped, I love seeing that stuff, it's in a basement, it's in some kind of, you know, pizza parlor, it's in something, yeah. and, and people are just going nuts, um, yeah. and it's just so, it's just so raw. Yeah, and it's like, you can, you can feel the punkiness <laughs> coming <laughs> from it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's why it actually brings up, I, don't know, I see some people are putting some comments and I'll get to those in a minute, guys. Um, I was, there's a band that's, I think they're coming here maybe in a couple months that, um, they claim to be a punk band and I don't really have a, an opinion one way or the other. Cause I like, you know, I like all kinds of music, lots of different yeah. genres, but apparently there's a lot of pushback on bands like this because they're like, what do they call them? Like fashion punk, like they look punk, but they're not of the aesthetic. They're not of the you know, the, the mm. lifestyle or the um, definitely in terms of like what they're putting lyrically into their music. Yeah. And do you have any opinion on that kind of thing since you're in a punk band? Um, I, I mean, to each their own, you know, <laughs> to each their own. 
if that's you know if that's what if that's what you're going to create and stuff like that i mean it wouldn't be my thing to go watch or whatever i'm sure um but um you know i i'm i used to be i feel like i used to be more critical of musicians and bands when i was younger like what the f what is that why uh, that's just so i don't know but these days i'm like i'm so like usually i can find the good in some whatever piece of junk <laughs> whatever some group that i'm like eh, i don't know whatever but there's like oh my gosh that singer is like killing it or that drummer or that you know or they they're trying they're trying you know or whatever and I, you know i'm sure people look at us and like what the hell are they putting out but i just i i'm not as critical as i used to be of that type of stuff i'm just like might not be my cup of tea but i'm sure there might be something in it that i would appreciate like the bat, bass players that in the bomb or whatever so um, okay well, yeah. we're kind of the same mentality then yeah <laughs> um, yeah and I, for me it probably goes back even like when i was uh, teaching some guitar lessons to students and they bring something in that i'm like oh man this is garbage i don't <laughs> I don't, I don't, want, I don't want to learn this song but yeah. you know, I, I don't want to be that person that crushes their you know their their love of this band right uh, especially when they're like i was teaching like they're like 13 14 year olds um, yeah. and when i was that age you know someone said you know iron Maiden, they suck i mean i don't want to hear that yeah <laughs> so and i know we... and i know that my uh you know it's funny that you say that too in art obviously our taste changed right like there was a time um <laughs> i joke about it sometimes like I, I remember being in seattle scene and i fucking hated nirvana i was like oh this is crap and then whatever 10 15 years later i'm like oh my god this was the this was so good. How come I didn't, you know, I didn't get it at the time. You know, our tastes are different or whatever. And then all of a sudden, and I'm sure a lot of these, you know, different bands and stuff, you're going to go through stuff where like, you're going to think this is a great band or whatever. And then later you're like, uh, I mean, not, or this is horrible and this is great. I mean, this is just part of our musical tastes and life evolving and all that. Yeah, very well said. Um, I, I'm a perfect example. I mean, I was just talking to somebody about this um, where was that? I think that was maybe been last week when I was I was at Beetlejuice. The musical was in town, um, and that's a perfect example. I was telling her that ten years ago, if you say, "Hey, Mark, you want to go see this musical?" I already said no. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would have said, you know, you can't pay me to go there. I'd rather be at home watching TV or something. Um, yeah. The, the ballet, the opera, all of those things. Oh, yeah. And once I kind of re got into trying it out, of course, it's because of the media outlet, but still, um, just giving it a shot and kind of realizing. You know, this is really similar to any kind of concert. It's live. There's live without a net. Um, they had to practice. They had to sacrifice. They had to do training. They do all this kind of stuff to get out there and perform for an audience. And hopefully the audience likes it. Yeah. And that's when I kind of realized, I think I like live events, period. Yeah. Um, performance. Performance is everything. I mean, I, over the years, like, I, a great performance can make me tear up. Like, you know, whether it be music or, like, uh what was it last night watching that uh the final four some of those performances just there's a physical performance whether it's music or sports or arts or whatever i mean just seeing someone excel that whatever it is that's exciting and that can be anywhere that could be in some freaking house show in the <laughs> middle of atlanta with some kid that just took up bass a couple years ago and still in high school or whatever so yeah no, I, i'm right there with you um i think that's also what helps drive me when it comes to doing these interviews, um, I want to talk to those people that I that they move me in some way. I'm just like, man, I want to know what's you know what's going on with you and how did you get here and why did you make me feel that way? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> kind of yeah, I want some of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so I'm so so grateful when I get a chance to talk to. Well, I'm grateful when I get to talk to anybody, but certain people that I've admired and then I get a chance to sit down with them one on one. I'm like, damn, I can't believe I'm talking to this person. Yeah, and especially. You know, knock on wood, um, I've been really, really fortunate. I've not had, you know, a jerk or an asshole um, as, as a guest. Um, and yeah. you know, maybe it's maybe it's coming, but uh, I, I hope not. <laughs> I think you do a good job of screening them and only asking the good ones. So, yeah. yeah well, stuff like that. <laughs> they, they always have that saying, like, don't meet your heroes. And I'm like, well, that hasn't been the case for me. Um, it's been yeah. the, the complete opposite. I've been, you know, so uh, much more of a fan of somebody after I've met them. That's um, awesome. Been really lucky with that way. And let's kind of get to some of the questions. Like I know Scotty, you're asking about um, does Mike tune your uh, do you tune your drum kit by ear or use a tune bot? Uh, both. So I start off by ear. Um, I get it to a place that I like, um, and then 
if if something seems off, then I'll put the tune bot on it um, and kind of get rid of something that I can't seem to get rid of by ear. Like I just can't figure out what is off. Uh, but I do definitely start by ear um, and then finish with the tune bot if needed. So, um, yeah. Okay, and that's, I see he's got like a follow up as well. He's, um, if he tunes to particular notes, how does he decide which notes? Example, perfect force, etc. So no, I I go for sound purely. Um, notes, I I really I've never got into that. I had one guy that wanted me to tune my drums to the <laughs> to his song scale, whatever, to have it mix, and I'm. I tried my best. It's not my forte, um, but you know I can go for a higher pitch or lower pitch. I hear something. You know, there's some sort of interval in between. But um, no, I don't go for exact notes. It's more of like I'm going for a sound. Do I need a low? Uh, do I want a, a low sound for my toms and high sound? You know, it's it's all about the sound. And then when I get in the range, um, you know, am I getting the response off the heads that I want and that type of stuff? But I've never gone for notes. I know people talk about that. Um, I'm sure there's people do it, but I, I just, I don't, or I've, yeah, I don't. Okay. And, and that actually kind of brings up a question uh, from me. Uh, do you teach lessons? So I did, uh, I've off and on over the years, uh, to be <laughs> perfectly blunt, I just didn't enjoy it. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I was telling, I was telling, um, Mike Johnston, he's the guy that we went to the drum camp and he's all about, I mean, his whole life's about drum lessons and these camps and stuff like that. And I actually, I used to have it on my site, on, on, you know, it was one of the tabs like drum lessons. And I had this whole thing and I had uh, uh, three or four kids from local high schools and junior highs and people coming in here. But um, uh I enjoyed hearing their stories and seeing them get better, but I just didn't, in, it was stressful for me. I didn't, I didn't enjoy giving lessons. It might be something later on in life I'll get back into, but I just, I felt like I was wasting my time when I wanted to be playing myself and <laughs> doing stuff and, and teaching kids just wasn't my thing. So um, I've actually, I've had a couple people reach out to me in the scene. They're like, Hey, I just, I love the way you play. Do you give lessons? And I'm like, no, but, if you want me to come over to your practice space and just listen and give you some tips, I'm all for that. You want to bounce some stuff off of me? That's cool. I'm not going to charge you anything. If you, you know, you want me to hear you play or, you know, give you some advice or something to work on. Absolutely. But if you want something every week, not going to happen. I just don't like it. <laughs> I'm not a, I'm not a drum teacher. I don't, at this point, I just, yeah, I'd rather keep, spend my life making music at this point, maybe later. I'll get back into teaching lessons, but I found I just didn't like it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, you know, at least you're, you're honest with yourself and you know, like, I don't like this. So I'm going <laughs> to do, I'm going to do this because some people try to convince themselves that, no, this is a good thing that I'm doing and I should stick with it. And it's like, well, no, maybe like you said, maybe you'll come back to it later. Yeah. Um, or maybe you won't come back into it at all. It just doesn't float your boat. Yeah. Um, and I, I like that you're you know willing to uh, almost like be a little bit of a, like a sounding board for stuff for another musician and yeah be almost like a i guess like a musician coach in a way yeah i enjoy that i mean i do that all day long um i get certain dms from people or what have you or talk through stuff at shows that is that's awesome i love you know helping people get over a hump or figure something out or what would you do there that type of stuff that i love yeah that's fun and in some ways, it kind of sounds like me when I'm getting messages about um, the interview process and also like securing guests. And Mark, I see that you're in a photo pit, you know, doing photography. And I see, you're, how did you get all this stuff together? Because I'm trying to do the same thing. I love talking about that kind of thing. And if I can help somebody else so they don't have to run into the same obstacles I did. Yeah, um, that's all the better. Um, but that also, I think, honestly, comes a little bit from my teaching background. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, when I used to, you know, warp young minds and all that kind of stuff. But I, I do like that. But yeah, when I, I didn't last long when I was doing guitar lessons. Um, yeah. It's kind of like, I know that's where you're at and we're starting from ground zero and we're working on car, you know, chords and making you don't get bad habits and all that kind of stuff. But yeah. it was just like, it's so laborious. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's just like, yeah. come on. <laughs> yeah. And there's other people that love it, that love teaching. I mean, I see this guy, Mike, he loves teaching and that's awesome, but it's just, 
not me. And I'm glad there's other people out there that love teaching. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, and we need it. And I, I, was, I think the question came from me just because you have such um, you have the technology piece of it. You have the, obviously the drum piece and all those other yeah. things kind of going for you. So, oh, it seems like it was just be a, a natural thing, especially now that we're because uh, I remember that tab on your site when it was drum lessons, but maybe they had to yeah. be virtual or something back there in the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. Um, but now it's like, no, you can come over to the studio. But yeah, if it's again, if somebody wanted me to teach them guitar, well, one, I would tell them to go see somebody else because I'm not very good anymore. But <laughs> <laughs> I will give you bad habits now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. I, right. I, I, I don't have I don't have the patience for it yeah. either. It's like what? Um, I see Scotty's asking um, uh, when they start touring. Can uh, can he be your drum tech? <laughs> Of course, man, I would love it if something like that happened. But, you know, uh, yeah, <laughs> of course, Scotty. And I get to be your drum tech when you go on tour, too. He's a He's got some bands going on in Dallas or in, in Texas. Uh, he's got some some interesting stuff going on. So well, that's cool. Yeah. So like with with Sam and with Scotty that are in the chat, you know, guys, definitely um, DM me or something, because I would love to check out the music that you're a part of. Um, yeah as mike knows and i don't know if ken's watching this from back in the day but uh and steve just texted me <laughs> <laughs> of course <laughs> um that i used to love just trying to find you know new bands and new things and try to turn people onto it and um you know all that kind of thing so and that just just gone like this again my scope is huge in terms of what i'm into so there's i can't think of too many genres i'd be like yeah i think i'll kind of pass on that one yeah um, so I'll, I'll definitely get something at least a once over and said, yeah. you know what? That's pretty cool. Like you just said earlier in part of the interview, that um, I'll find something that I can kind of hang my hat on about yeah. it. And I, I love you know black metal demos. It sounds like a recording in a garbage can. <laughs> you know, to everything. Yeah. It doesn't have to be this really polished piece of music or yeah. whatever art you're doing. Um, yeah. I can kind of see through it. Say, you know, I, I really there's something about this that I really dig, and I want to learn more about it. Yeah. Um, there was a period of time during the pandemic during the, during these interviews. I was bringing people on that were viewers because they were also artists or they're doing something else. Yeah. I said, why not? Why don't I bring you on and talk to you about this? And like, you want yeah. to talk to me? <laughs> and I'm kind of like, yeah, you. I want to yeah, talk yeah. to you. And yeah. it, it was fun that way because I think everyone does have some sort of, um, you know, artistic interest, and it could be you know design or drawing or something that fashion, something that I don't know anything about. Oh yeah. But you know, when people are passionate about what they're into, that that definitely flows my boat. So I was like, I want to hear more about it. So let's kind of shine a spotlight on you. Yeah. And. Um, Awesome. <laughs> so, but um, let's see. There's in your, so you've kind of talked about the band a lot, and we've talked a little bit about Shooting Star and you know, one drummer drumming. And um, I'll ask. I usually don't ask typical questions. I try to stay away from those when I can. <laughs> but I am kind of interested. Where do you think you'll be in five years? Five years. Um, I know that. Um, that is a point that we've actually, as far as like life, like it's um, um, the uh, that could be the end of life for Shooting Star um, for my business uh, or where I exit it or someone else takes it over. Um, that's kind of like we've looked at that, that that's when my kids are hopefully going to be graduating college and starting their lives or what have you, uh, post-college lives or what have you. Um, and so uh, it's kind of that time period where me and my wife think that, you know, you know, maybe I'll be able to officially retire, even though I feel like I'm semi retired now. Um, as far as, you know, music and stuff, um, uh, it, you know, kind of just seeing how it goes with uh, over the next few years with Red Hot Empty. There's a couple other bands I'm in, too, that are just starting up um, one called the McMansions um, that. Uh, I started as a drum tracking gig like the end of last year uh, they needed drums and i did that and then they were looking for a, a live drummer and i started going to their practices and all of a sudden now i'm i'm in their band and we're we got shows coming up and I'm scheduling that in between the red hot empty shows and we're also recording and putting out uh first album and all that type of stuff so i'm i definitely over the next five years i i feel like i want to see where those bands go i would love to get an you know to find an offer or a, an opportunity to tour. Um, I don't know if Red Hot Empty or McMansions are are really looking to do that. We've had that discussion with Red Hot Empty and we look to be more of like an Atlanta band. Um, just everyone's, you know, life and work schedules and where they are. 
I don't see us up, you know, ever doing like a U.S. tour. Um, uh, and I'm not sure on the McMansions either, but there, that would be something that I'm hoping like in four or five years, I'd be talking to you like, oh, hey, I'm, I'm getting to do a U.S. tour with, you know, whatever, bim, bam, boop, whatever that needed a drummer. Um, so I'd, I'd still like to do something, you know, of that effect. Um, so some bigger gigs or, you know, some sort of tour or, or uh, uh, something like that. I'd love to see myself doing, you know, over the next three, four, five years. But as far as, you know, life, that's that's what I'm looking at. Maybe Shooting Star will be dwindling down, be able to pour more of my energy into music and, uh, you know, maybe get a tour out of it somewhere here and there. Okay. That's, um, that, that's, uh, it makes sense, especially with the timeline with your sons. Um, yeah. You know, having graduated, <laughs> you know, starting the next chapter of their lives. Uh, yeah. you, can, you could potentially close one piece of a chapter of your own life. Right. And then, yeah, kind of, I mean, that's why they call it, you know, retirement supposed to be the golden years when you're kind of working on what you want to work on and do what you want to do. Yeah. And in your case, it'd be like, I want to go on tour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, you know, I feel like I've, I've been able to start early because shooting star was doing so well by like stuff that I just want to do that I can do it again. Like I was, when I was younger and it didn't have to make money, it, it doesn't right now because of other things that support. Um, so that allows me to really dump my, you know, energy into something that might not have much of return at this point. So, yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if you, um, if you've been following any of the Alice stuff, but um, and they, they have an app called tour router that Tosh and Scott um, developed. And hmm. so it's, and I think Tosh is working on a book. I could be wrong, but, um, that's like a you know, companion piece to this app, but it's a, a something designed specifically for independent musicians on how you can tour because that's what mm. they do. They've been doing it for years. Yeah. And how to book your gigs, how to, you know, pitfalls, things like that. But this app, I guess, will help you find venues in different cities and the states and all this kind of stuff. And it's fascinating. So that actually went, I think that thing went live a few months ago at least. Huh. Um, and so like, when you're, yeah, when you're talking about touring and yeah. actually, you did the fun table with Steve from Alice yeah. uh, uh, back in the day. And it might be something that you can just kind of poke around at and see, is this something that might be viable somewhere in, you know, if it's five years from now or for yeah, two yeah. years or whatever, um, because they keep saying that they get people that come to their show, especially other bands, all like local bands on their bill saying, oh, how do you guys do this? You know, we want to tour too. And that's where the idea kind of came from that well, let's create this app and let's kind of show you what we do and how we book our stuff. Cause they don't have a booker or an agency. They do it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, they've, been do they've been doing it, you know, every year other than the pandemic. <laughs> so. Yeah. No, I mean, that's what we mostly see around here is um, uh, like we play a lot of shows with touring bands that come through and they usually, it's usually, it's no one, not a booking agent, but it's some, it's someone from the band that hits us up. It's like, Hey, we're going to be in there June 9th. Can you, uh can you put it together or can we get on a bill and a show with you and then we'll organize it or they've already organized something they want some local acts and they've looked us up or what have you um but it is everything that i've seen it's very diy on um you know at least at our level those types of things but that app sounds definitely interesting um there's a couple of local bands that make the like you know the touring between like Alabama, Tennessee, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, maybe they'll go up the coast, you know, Washington, DC, New York, they'll do that type of run. We said a lot of that. And that seems like there's enough networking that if we wanted to do that, I feel like we could, but it's just a time thing. And like, Hey, can we all get <laughs> two to three weeks off of work to go, you know, run a tour up the East coast or what have you? Yeah, no, that's, that's the same issue that Alice, you know, faces. That's what they do like two weeks. Sometimes they've done four week spurts for tours, but they yeah. all have, they all have various jobs and other pieces of their lives. So I know like in Steve's case, being a doctor, he has, he talked about, it, he has to stack shifts. He works a whole bunch of bunch of shifts so that he can basically earn two weeks off to go tour. Yeah. Um, and he has to plan it that way. And all the other members too, they got their, their various jobs that they do. Um, and, uh, but yeah, that's a, that's a very real issue for, for, for yeah, sure. Yeah. Like, hey, can, can you just stop what you're doing for two weeks? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, no, I can't. I can't even stop for two days. I mean, I, I want to, but it just you start weighing stuff out. Right. Um, and going up the coast on the east side, I mean, that makes perfect sense. Just like bands here in Seattle, you know, going down the west coast, going down yeah. to Portland, and going down San Francisco, and all that. Yeah. Um, and so that's, I think the first kind of you know step that makes sense is like, well, go where you know. Um, yeah. 
and then maybe you can start in our case start moving east <laughs> you guys yeah. can start working west <laughs> yeah i mean that's some things like i feel like there's a couple bands that that are in our scene that do a lot of that around the area that we could tag on but i think a lot of it's just you know time and effort but yeah that that do those like they get out and make a circle route a couple weeks and then they come back that type of thing so um um my schedule would, would allow me to do that but it's trying to find you know a band that like everyone's schedule because you know i can do a lot of my stuff remotely um but uh but yeah not everyone can so that's the thing so uh yeah, yeah. i mean i'm not in a band but if i was i can't leave my job i can't do it remotely <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly would, yeah be, i wish i could <laughs> yeah yeah this doesn't work <laughs> nah but uh yeah, but it's still, I mean, what we're doing locally is still, you know, heck of a lot of fun. So, but yeah, yeah maybe some. Well, and that's, and that, I mean, it comes back, and I think this, this came up in another interview where at the end of the day, you have to just enjoy what you're doing. Um, yep. And they talk about you can't measure success by dollars, you can't measure by streams or, you know, CD sales, or any of that kind of stuff. Oh, no. It's got to be like, are you digging what you're doing? Um, yeah. And then eventually, you know, the audience finds you, you know, whatever that audience looks like. Yeah, and I'm doing these things. So I'm thinking back since we did the the Atlas tour, I I didn't even understand like what subscribers on YouTube were. I didn't, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know what that was. And yeah, I went I looked at my channel at the time. There's like some number next to it. I'm like, okay, I guess people did. So I wasn't doing that myself. I wasn't subscribing to anybody else's channel. I didn't know what that was. Yeah, and then yeah, well, following those guys and they're kind of talking about it a lot. Oh, you need to do this. Follow us on Twitch and all that. So I'm like, oh, I guess this is like a thing or something. And then I realized, oh, well, if you do this, is how you build your audience. That's how you get more things. And if in YouTube's case, you can monetize after a thousand subscribers and all this other kind of stuff. Um, went down that rabbit hole for a while. And so, you know, now it's definitely, I'm very, very aware of it, but to yeah. an extent, because you can sit there and look at the analytics and just drive yourself nuts. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, you know, I've always, uh, you know, especially with the drumming side of it, you know, I, I when I first started putting myself out there again or what have you you know you see these these drummers or bands and stuff that just have you know thousands and thousands of <laughs> followers and stuff like that and some of them have built it up over time but some of them are you know it's the easy thing like they're doing you know a cover song and they they do stuff like that to to build up views or whatever and it's uh, you know i've just i felt like i just need to do what i do i mean there's no way that mike gruel's music is um uh, the popular music of the day, <laughs> but it's what I enjoy making, you know, so from, you know, that, that, that G town sound to by the numbers, um, all that solo music, it's like, you know, screw the, whatever the numbers and all that stuff. It's, this is music that I enjoy that I love making. And this is what's coming out of me. And, you know, there's going to be some people that will you that'll like it, but it's not, you know, it's not for the masses per se. Um, and uh, I just keep putting that, you know, type of content, I guess, if you want to call it that, out there. I've just put out <laughs> what comes out of me. So I'm not taking the, you know, the uh, going for the easy whatever numbers by doing, playing a cover to, I don't know, whatever, Home Sweet Home or some crap like that. Uh, that's dating me a bit. But, yeah. <laughs> I, I know what that song is. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so I, I don't know where we're going with all that. But yeah, it's, you know, I think that's, there's definitely those numbers. And you want people to to get into it. But um, but yeah, I, I stopped looking at that a long time ago. And it's just like, I enjoy getting better at, you know, creating new beats and stuff. I mean, a lot of my, my content, besides the music that I do with Red Hot Empty or McMansions or what have you, um, on my solo stuff, it's it's all about uh making a new making new sounds on the drums making new beats putting stuff together like when i come down and i'm just messing around all of a sudden something will come out of me i'm like oh that's something i've never done before i've never that's a groove that sounds you know something that i really want to you know keep track of in case i want to come back to it so i'll flip on the cameras turn on the recording stuff and jam it out for a while and then i'll like oh there's a minute clip i'll throw that up there and then go back my day of creating more stuff so um that's always been kind of the way there isn't like this, like, oh, I want to get this. I want to make sure that I have some like fast uh, double bass stuff. I want to make sure that I've got some, you know, stuff that's going to get, you know, make sure that it's got this in it and, you know, make sure it's showy or whatever. It's just this is what I enjoy doing. So uh. 
I, I think we kind of are in a similar boat because if I was going strictly to get, you know, more subscribers, let's say on YouTube, then I need to be interviewing certain types of guests. Yeah. I mean, that, that's just the facts of it. And yeah. I always go by people that I want to interview guests that I want to talk to. And yeah. <laughs> so I, I don't care about the numbers that it's going to be. Obviously, like you were saying, it's great if the numbers come with that, but that's yeah. not, that's not what's driving it at all. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. And you can look through, you know, the interviews I've done this year, which has only been like, I think, well, I should know this. You're number nine <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> <laughs> this year. Um, and some of them came from, you know, press releases for things that I wasn't familiar with the artist. And I checked, oh, this is kind of interesting. I never talked to them. Uh, and some of those people that I know, just like yourself. Um, yeah. And, but it's like, if I'm looking strictly by like based on their followings and all this other kind of shit on social media, like, oh no, I better not talk to those people. I better talk yeah. to somebody over yeah. here <laughs> from, from this movie that's coming out. Yeah. Um, I was like, no, and if I genuinely and organically like what you're doing, then I want to talk to you. Yeah. Um, and I said, it's still funny to me when I reach out to somebody who's like, I don't understand why you want to interview me. And I'm like, because they don't view I'm themselves interested that in way. You. Right. Yeah. yeah like, I'm oh, interested I, in you. Yeah. <laughs> I saw you act in this short film for this film festival and you were a stand up performance. So I really would like to talk to you about what you've done so far. And yeah. then they'll go, they'll go look at the YouTube thing, watch some of the more recent interviews, and then they usually look at back at me, and either they're more intimidated, which is really funny to me, <laughs> uh, or they'll say, oh, I, I'd like to do this, but I've never done this before. So I can walk you through it. I've you know, had a lot of new people <laughs> come yeah. on. And I've done over 350 of these. I've done plenty of in-person ones as well. So you know, we, we can make this happen, and trust me, you'll be in good hands. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah. that's, that's kind of nice. I mean, Again, it goes back to what organically are you into? You know, what are you in your case? What you're trying to put out there artistically? Yeah. And uh, if you're staying true to that, then you know there there is no wrong. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, right. Anybody that anybody that's watching, if you have any other questions for Mike, uh, as we're going to get closer to to winding this down and all that kind of thing, um, I'm kind of curious. So I'm going to be going to the show tomorrow night, just as a fan. I'm not covering. Um, yeah. I've, been going to more shows the last two years just as a fan i'm kind of learning to enjoy being a fan again instead of having responsibility yeah <laughs> <laughs> when I'm at these shows yeah i think it's nice. because I, I got enough of the art side where i do have to have responsibility in writing reviews and all this um yeah. is, is there anything new or at least new to you that's you know you're, you're kind of digging these days mm. um i mean there's a ton of people on instagram that are like but I couldn't tell you <laughs> their names. Uh, um, good grief. Yeah, I couldn't tell you. I mean, there's so much stuff that, you know, some trumpet player, there's this drummer I saw the, you know, yesterday that she's beating some drum and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, uh, like a recent show, I went to, you know, I went and saw Living Color the other day. Um, they were came through Seattle. Of course, that's nothing new, but <laughs> it was awesome seeing them again. Um, but uh, as far as like something new music wise, um, nothing that's like, you know, I have to like go through my Spotify or what have you. I can't. Yeah, I don't know of anything that's like, oh, my gosh, you guys have got to hear that because it's like, there's so much that I, you know, put through and listen to. Um, mm. <laughs> he got me there. <laughs> oh no, my god! I don't have anything that I could recommend. Hey, man, man you got to go check this out. You know, this band or this artist is killer. Um, yeah. I, for me, it's more like I'm curious about somebody. Like maybe I did hear something, or yeah. You know, in this case, tomorrow. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Leve. She's this Icelandic Chinese singer songwriter that is like, so her, her tour went on sale in December and it yeah. sold out the entire tour sold out that day. Yeah. And it's just like, what, what the hell? Um, and uh, she was actually here in Seattle in October and she sold that show out. So I'm like, who is this person? Yeah. And I was talking to a friend here who's about my age and he's got a 15 year old son. He's like, Oh, we might surprise my son with tickets to that show on Tuesday night. I'm like, did you buy them back in December? Because the reseller thing's like it's just stupid, you know, right now, how much they're charging for that stuff. And he's like, Well, no, we know we have to pay, you know, more money for it, but he he'd really, really want to go to that show. And I'm like, dude, it's like two hundred, three hundred dollars easy. <laughs> and he's like, What? And I'm like, Yeah, and when I bought mine just at face value, they're sixty five bucks or something. Um, it's like, Oh, and when he saw the disparity between, you know, what he could have got them for. 
Yeah. And he's like, yeah, maybe he'll have to wait till she comes back again or whatever. <laughs> oh, my gosh. But I was asking him, why does your son like her? Because I'm curious. Like, I don't understand. And maybe she's amazing. I'll, I'll find out tomorrow night. But right. um, he, he said, well, you know, my son is in band. He studies this, this, and this. And he really likes all the different. So she's um, jazz vocal trained. And she's also cello classically trained. Hmm. Um, so she's very much a jazz type of singer. That's why I'm like, why do people are why they're so crazy about her right now? And it's and it's young people. <laughs> it's that's it's awesome. People, yeah. So it's like, and I was I was looking stuff online since my friend didn't have a good answer for me about his son. Yeah. Um, apparently, what people are saying is that she went viral on TikTok at one point, hmm. and then for a lot of the younger generation, they think her style of music is something fresh and new. They think jazz is new somehow. Yeah. Um, so hearing that kind of vocal versus, you know, Taylor Swift or rap or hip hop yeah. or whatever they listen to. So I said, OK, that kind of makes some sense that it, it doesn't sound like something you're used to hearing. I think that was like it was interesting. Uh, Ray, that was on Saturday Night Live last night or whatever, was in that same type of like bringing some jazz back um, that I hadn't heard before in a while. Um, uh, I don't know if you know who she is, but that was one that like kind of piqued my interest of like, oh, you don't usually hear that. Um, you don't usually hear that. So um, I was scrolling through to see if there's like someone that like sticks out at me that like, oh, my gosh, I've been listening to them a bunch. Uh, but uh, uh, anywho. Yeah, it's all like, well, anyway, I, I've I've been um I've been pretty staunch for a long time against streaming overall. If I can help, I've been trying to not do that. And then I, I succumbed to it a couple, you know, probably February, um, where I have stuff on my phone. I'm using it when I'm at work, so I can just kind of listen to it. And I understand why people like it. I mean, if I want to listen to an artist that I don't own anything of, you know, yeah. you know like 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 Alan Singh tomorrow night, I can go to her thing on Apple Music or whatever, and yeah. there's her, her there's her catalog. And I can hit shuffle, and boom, I've got two hours of music. Oh yeah. And it's just so like the new Judas Priest came out. I have the CD, but I listened to it first on on my phone. Yeah, <laughs> so that's like I get why people make playlists, just like we make you know make uh, mixtapes back mixed in the day. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I'm still like, well, I, that doesn't support the artist if you're nah. really into somebody. So I try to buy something, or yeah, go to a show, you know, buy a T-shirt, whatever. Yeah. Um, and when and you would know being in a punk band, then it's like, yeah, you know, buy something, <laughs> buy yeah. something from us. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's um, yeah, that's the you know that you know we yeah we don't make anything off of or basically nothing off of streaming or what have you. But yeah, it's all the, it's the merch, it's the uh, um, you know t-shirts and CDs and vinyl that we're doing and stuff like that. Um, um, and that's how I pick up you know when we're playing with other bands, you know I try and pick up their CD or what have you because um, I still have a CD player in my car, so <laughs> that still works, and I got record player, a couple of record players in the house. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, and, you know, I, I think it's great that you have younger artists that are also putting, you know, physical product out too. Yeah. There's so much of it. You know, I don't, you know, we've had some people come up just like, Hey, we want CD singles or we want stuff like that. I'm like, that's it's so crazy. I mean, that's awesome. But it's like, um, uh, you know, I don't, I know there's some sort of vinyl, you know, revolution per se going on. I don't think it's like it's mainstream yet. I mean, there's a lot, definitely a lot more, um, but it's still, it's, it's still the people that really love your band and want it. They want that. They want to see that. And, you know, we put liner notes in our vinyl and stuff like that. Um, that's in everything that we put out these days, you know, we're putting out at least a CD. We even put a cassette out for one of our albums uh, with Red Hot Empty um, with vinyl and stuff like that. And it's more collector type stuff than it is really like, they're still going to go probably mostly listen to you on Apple or Spotify or YouTube or what have you. But, um, but they still, they like having that and that's awesome too. So and we enjoy doing the artwork and putting all that stuff out. So, um, yeah. Yeah. When I get to talk to, um, you know, musicians doing these interviews, one of the questions, especially if they're independent, I always ask them and they're like, oh, we have a new thing, a new album coming out. I'm like, is there going to be a physical product of this? Um, is it strictly digital? And um, when they say, yeah, we, we already have the vinyl at the pressing plant or we're looking at maybe if there's interest in CDs or the, definitely cassettes are definitely coming back. Yeah. Um, I'm like, that's awesome because that's me. That, that, yeah. That, that, I, 
Yeah, it's pretty rare these days. I don't know of many people that just do, at least in the scene that we're in and stuff like that, everyone, if they're they're taking the time to record something, you're going to be able to pick it up on CD or vinyl or, you know, um, which is awesome. I mean, even the stuff that I've gone back, um, you know, and redone, um, you know, we've talked a little bit about that in the past of like, gone back and redone Black Moses and Stone Dresden and re-released those. I did them on CD and vinyl and put that stuff out just because it's still collector. And I, I wanted to have a copy of this on vinyl or what have you. Um, in fact, we're, I'm working with um, Brent Anderson and Joel Ross from Lake Washington, um, who were in DFL with me. And we finally found the lost DFL, like original oh. tape from 1988 that we recorded at Reciprocal Studio of our... Uh, movement uh album and uh Brent, me and joel we've been talking about it for years like oh it's gone it's lost and whatever and we'd actually ask jack and dino he's like what you guys rented a tape and we're like did we <laughs> and like we rented a tape i mean <laughs> it just seemed weird you know, like yeah it was recorded over i'm sure and then uh all of a sudden brent was like hey i got this in my closet and there it was the original like master you know real tape so he took it to Jack and Dino a few months ago. And uh, so actually, yeah, so we found that. But as soon as we get that all remixed and re-released, um, I mean, we're going to put that on CD and vinyl, too. It's just, you know, it's one of those things you want that keepsake um, and to put it out there. So um, we're actually excited that that real tape that we had from when we recorded it Reciprocal had a bunch of extra songs and stuff we did in there. We didn't release. It's just he just kept it running. He kept the thing running. So um there's, we're kind of excited to see what the hell else is on there. Um, so, yeah. That's that's awesome. I, I mean, I haven't heard the name Joel Ross <laughs> forever. Yeah, he, um, you know, he, uh, I didn't know it, but, you know, he, he kept going after uh, I left to go to Texas for a year. And um, they, I, I think they tried to keep DFL together a little bit, but then, he ended up joining a band called Lopez, which was really big for a while. Um, and um, uh, so he stayed into, you know, in the music scene this whole time and stuff like that. Um, and then we connected again, whatever, about 10 years ago. Um, and I visited him out in Oregon um, and I reconnected with Brent. Um, but but yeah, they it's funny. We're now Brent is actually sending me tracks and we're actually trying to write a whole new album remotely he's sending me guitar and bass tracks and we're sending it to brent to try and put or joel to put vocals on um so that's fun i mean still like that connection and and you know talking back to those people that you just had this you know that like this lifetime connection with um you know back in the when it all started per se yeah that's that's uh, uh, amazing and it's crazy at the same time i mean <laughs> that you know all these years later that you guys are you know hey let's try to do some new music and see what kind of happens yeah <laughs> it was funny i i bugged them during the pandemic and this was whatever you know like four years ago i you know at the time and we still hadn't found the dfl tape or whatever but i'm like hey let's let's uh, <laughs> let's start creating some music you know at that time everyone was closed in i'm like we could send tracks back and forth and brent was like oh, i don't know how to do any of that and Joel's like, I just got out of Lopez. I don't know. And then, and then all of a sudden, here we are four years later. Brent's like, all right, I got figured it out. And he's sending me a couple songs and uh, we're passing around. It's just, it's awesome that he's like, I'm glad you finally pushed me to get into this again. So, um, so that's been fun. Yeah. Wow. Well, I, I, I can't wait to uh, buy a CD when that actually gets out and have some yeah. extra stuff on it that you guys are like. <laughs> Yeah, what else did, that, did we record while it was exactly? <laughs> yeah, I'm excited to hear all that. So, uh, yeah, Jack has sent us a, one track so far that he mixed, and then I guess you know he's busy as all get out, and plus being remote, it's a little bit. Although Brent's there to go talk to him as if need, as needed, but um, we get pushed to the end of his list. But <laughs> he's still working on it. He texted us the other day. He's like, "Okay, I'm getting back into it." I'm like, "Great, great, great. Let's hear it." <laughs> So uh, DFL. See, when I think of DFL, I think of there's a band that uh, was like a class uh, above me or you know, older than me. That was, I think they were called Quick to Fix QTF. 
and really Thomas Vogel was the drummer, if I remember right. And okay. uh, Mark Fisher was on guitar, and there's a couple other. I think they're a four piece. Um, but I just thought it was weird that what's this deal with three words? You know, for these bands. <laughs> <laughs> We actually, you know, we start out as NME, so NME, <laughs> and uh, Joel got a call from some dude in prison that said, "Hey, that's my band name. Go use it." <laughs> He's like, "Okay, we're gonna switch it." <laughs> oh my gosh! That's crazy. <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. And now I think about it, which I'm not gonna get into too many details, but you know, the little thing that I was doing in, when I was in high school. That was three, three, three as well. <laughs> so, oh gosh, that's crazy. And just, yeah, so folks that are out there watching, they're like, what the fuck are they talking about? <laughs> we're, 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 we're kind of going way down memory lane oh, yeah, back, yeah. Into, back into the 80s with high school and kangaroos and all that. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. Um, but I'm trying to remember, like with DFL, um, did you guys play? Like, did you do some songs or even like a, did you do a show or like a benefit in the drum room or not the drum the band room at high school? Uh, I, I mean, I don't know if we did. I know that we, uh, I know we tried to play prom and they wouldn't, they denied us. So I didn't go to prom. <laughs> we tried to be a band at prom I and mean, we played, we could have done, I mean, I know we played a bunch of shows, but it's just like, I look back at some of that stuff like I've dug through and I'm like, I don't even remember this show. And they're like, oh, yeah, we, this is awesome. Like, yeah. And we were maximum rock and roll. And, you know, we started we I mean, that was my first band. That was 88 uh, or we recorded at uh, Reciprocal at 1988. So, you know, I graduated 89. Um, and uh, so, I mean, I was a junior when I'm sitting there in a recording studio with Jack and Dino recording this i mean it's just I mean, sometimes it blows my mind that you know we had all these opportunities and i remember being in the jazz bands all the jazz bands recorded in studios we put out records as a jazz band like the rose hill junior high jazz band put out a record every year it's just so crazy to me we go to the studio a real studio i mean just the experience that was so rich in seattle at that time or the east side or what have you um with you know gary evans and all that stuff and i think that just opened up to all of us that were in music at that time. It was just such a rich atmosphere of like, uh, you know, it wasn't looked down on. It was just part of who you were. It was, it was just such an awesome period to be a part of. Yeah, that's, um, I, I have for the most part, good memory <laughs> <laughs> of that time. Um, and cause I, I remember like, so when I was teaching, especially when I was working with some of the, the inner city gang kids, and I'd bring my guitar in and I would actually do this whole thing about music and kind of like a school of rock deal. And they'd always ask me, like, would I ever want to go back to that time? I'm like, certain things about, yeah, but overall, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm happier now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, we were all dealing with school and weirdness and all the puberty, all that crazy issues. Yeah. All, <laughs> and just all, life. Weird all life. the usual stuff yeah yeah <laughs> um, you know, and every, everybody hopefully grows and matures and, you know and life happens and you kind of um experience life hopefully in a good way <laughs> and, yeah, yeah and and things just kind of blossom the way they do i mean i mean if you had if someone had come back to the high school you know band room and said you know what mike you're going to be interviewed by mark you know 40 years from <laughs> right. now yeah, you've been like, what are you talking about? Yeah, and I, yeah. and I would have been like, what are you talking about? Because I don't even like to talk. You know, back you're right. super quiet. So it's like, uh, you know, you're, you must be on something right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and, and yet here we are, you know, doing yeah. this whole thing. We've all been, um, you know, our hands in different parts of the arts and just kind of you know, doing what we love. So it's it's interesting. And I I, I do see Scotty's talking about or asking, um, how did the uh, Red Hot Empty band name originate? So that was from, uh, Sarah came up with that. Um, that was before I was in the band. Um, again, they were the Wilcox wing success project or something that comes from something. Ben had that name before. Um, but, uh, as far as the meaning behind it, I'd need Sarah here to explain it because <laughs> every time she does, but, uh, yeah, I'm like, that makes sense. And then I'm like, Wait, what did she just say? <laughs> <laughs> what is that? 
So yeah, it was something that she came up with. Uh, it definitely has a deeper meaning that I always forget. But, um, <laughs> she'll kill me next time I see her. You know what? It just it just dawned on me. You know, you're we talking about DFL, red yeah. hot empty, three words. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, DFL. Of course, that was like Ross dress for less. We took. I think that's where he originally got it from. Yeah, his last yeah. name. Yeah. Yeah. And and Ross stores are still around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh my gosh! Uh, yeah, that's that's fun. Yeah, you can't get away from the <laughs> one drummer drumming. You can't. Get yeah, yeah. Away it's from the, the three words. Yeah, I am in a band called the McMansions now. So, you yeah. know, so that's two. I guess we're uh, trying maybe, to break the mold. So maybe your next project will just be one word. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is one. I mean, it's called Grace. So hey, oh. hey, there you go. There you go. Oh, there got, I got one word. Three, two, one. one got it all. Yeah. It's, about, it's all good. <laughs> So. Um, are you, you're so busy, obviously, with everything we've been talking about in this interview. Um, are you still doing anything uh, like with a worship band or with your with your church or anything like that? I am not. So, yeah, when I when I uh, stepped back from doing um, uh, to work on the solo album, basically, it was like 2019 when I started working on my solo album um, and I wanted just the time or what have you. Um, I did. And. You know, life changes, thoughts change, <laughs> belief systems change. You know, I've been over my years, I've, you know, you know, they talk about like, hey, you can't change anyone's mind. <laughs> I'm a perfect example of someone's mind that can get changed for a variety of things over the years. So I would say that, you know, I, uh, anyway, it's, uh, yeah, it's not something I'm in interested in right now. Um, so, uh, no, yeah, I, everything that I do is with, you know, the music that's, you know, here or what have you. So, um, but, you know, I did, I went, you know, it was weird. So like, I don't know how much we knew each other. Like, I guess a little bit like junior high and high school, I met, uh, someone and I got really deep and I, you know, I used to have a jacket that leather jacket that said Jesus died for the ungodly was painted on the back of it. They used to wear to high school and stuff like that. I got very deep into the uh, the Christian church um, in the toward the latter years of high school. Um, in fact, I think that kind of changed DFL a little bit. We were like, we used to be like East Side hardcore, and then when I joined the band, we became Straight Edge hardcore. Joel started changing some of the lyrics about instead of about drinking, about not drinking. But you know, it was funny. Uh, and I went to Dallas, Texas, to become a youth minister. And I came back and then ideas changed. And I wanted nothing to do with the church for another good 20 years. And then whatever, I reached out or I decided to get involved again. But I don't know, things changed. And I, you know, like, I remembered why I walked away before. And so it's not something I'm interested in at all. Okay. All yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, when you mentioned um, Texas, that's where I remember during one of the other interviews, you talked about you went there. Because I was learning stuff about you that I didn't know. Um, at yeah, that point. so I was like, oh, I wonder if you're still involved with something now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it, it's to, to each his own. <laughs> Obviously, yeah. I'm, I'm not religious and I don't care if somebody is, you know, whatever that religion may yeah. be. Um, yeah, so. I've never like, you know, and that's something that me and Joel have always connected on um, was that, you know, he's like, you never pushed anything on anyone. It was like something you believed in and you wanted to go do or it was part of your life. But it never was. And I think I've moved in and out of those circles with people like going, you you do what or you do believe or you don't. And like, yeah, I just no. And it's like so I've never been like one of those. And that's I think that's one of the main things that <laughs> that bothers me. The deeper you get into something like that, where it's always like, well, you're now you're supposed to be a, you know, help bring other people in. I'm like, oh, hell no, that's not. No, no this is <laughs> not what I signed up for or what I believe in so you know whatever i get a sour taste and i'm like i don't want anything part of it and, uh, <sighs> yeah yeah there, <laughs> there was a young guy at the, the last job that i worked that um he was probably like maybe 24 25 um and at one point he, he told me uh what religion he was affiliated with and i didn't ask him it just kind of came out yeah and we would have we talked all the time about movies he's a huge movie buff and he knew what i did with the media outlets and we talked you know shop forever and um, you could tell that he was really hesitant about 
who he told that to because mm. people automatically have a certain viewpoint of that kind of person. Oh, you follow this. Yeah. And yeah. That, that means yeah. this, this, and this. And I'm like, man, you know, do what you do. And he said the exact same things. And I don't want to push this on anybody because it was a personal decision. Right. Um, and I said, well, that's, that's why I can respect it. And that's why you and I still talk to, you know, <laughs> yeah. about everything because I know you're not yeah. going to be going from, Hey Mark, did you see the new movie on Friday too? Hey, have you found Jesus? You know, that right. kind of, I'm like, yeah. I don't want that in my right. life. So yeah. th it's great that you did. Again, I have no issue with it, but um, that's, that's you. And I'm going to do me. So right. uh, we're going to keep it that way. And it's a funny, <laughs> Scotty a little while ago put in that McMansions is three syllables. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> he got us there. I like that. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And, uh, Hi, Susan. Yeah, thanks for, you know, lurking and listening and having it on the background. Uh, Susan, someone I used to work with um, oh, awesome. over at the, the high tech college in Redmond. What a pressure cooker that place was. You know, one thing I was going to mention to you, and I don't know if they're coming before I forget, is that uh, you had done one of my favorite fun tables with Wade Murph. Uh, um, Wade, yeah. I follow yeah. him as much as I can. He's, yeah. He, he's drumming for Orgy right now on their tour that's coming up. And I don't know if they're coming down your way or not, but I know he's coming up here. Yeah, I think I looked. I'll have to look again. I'm going to say because I, I thought of the same thing. as like if he was coming through Atlanta, I would definitely want to go see him. But I feel like I looked and like it was all around freaking Atlanta. Like <laughs> it was, you know, Florida and Tennessee and but nothing in Atlanta. I have to look again. But um, but yeah, he's a freaking killer drummer and I love seeing his stuff. And he, the thing is, I've loved seeing him evolve. Um, where he's doing now some of the, I know he does cover stuff, but he does it so well. And he does some of the background vocals for some of the stuff that he's doing as well. Um, and uh, he just, yeah, he's a freaking awesome, just a beast behind the drums. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I'm uh, still- uh, And a I mean, nice guy. Uh, yeah, <laughs> great guy, uh, still a fan of his drum style and everything he does. I think it was interesting he had done a cover that was something kind of um not what i was expecting it was something more definitely more groove oriented almost like funk yeah. kind of thing i was like yeah can he, can he actually lay it down like that because i think of him being a hard-hitting like rock yeah, yeah. metal type of drummer as like, wow he's kind of in the pocket there yeah um, oh, i don't remember what's i mean because dude my memory's so bad uh but i remember it's the same type of thing where there was something out of left field that surprised me and i sent him a note about it because it was like whoa that's like i wasn't expecting that from him and he just nailed it you know like some madonna or some some tune that i was like just was not expecting from him and he just i mean just crushed it absolutely crushed it yeah yeah that's awesome i'm i gotta double check what date they're up here in seattle but i'm like uh, i've seen orgy before when he wasn't you know drumming with them and yeah. then um i know that uh Erica Vincent, who's a photographer, I know who used to be up here, has been down in LA. She knows Wade because they live pretty close to each other. And then she's super close to the Orgy guys because I think that was the first professional band she ever shot. So hmm. she's like, she's almost like you know, another member of the band kind of thing. So I think she's going to be up here, you know, for like the, the, the Northwest shows shooting okay. the band. So I'm like, oh, I got to try to get to that show then because she'll be there. Wade will be there. Um, yeah. I've, I've never actually met Wade in person. I've only seen him drum in person. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. When he was with Doyle, um, I met well, Alex is from Cancer Slug, so that's my guy. And then I met Doyle a few times, but then I never, I never saw Wade hanging around the tour bus or you know upstairs or anything. I, I don't know where he was. Yes. <laughs> um, I just saw him get behind the kit and they start doing the the drum intro, the the intro to Abominator, um, yeah. and that's why when we went into the pandemic, I'm like, I'd like to talk to this guy. And then he was, he oh, he also drummed for, um, he helped. Fell, uh, the Jenna Torturers. Uh, from oh, okay. Florida. He, wow. They needed some help, so he was doing some. So I saw him drum there, and I got some pictures of him. But yeah, yeah. I, I, I never met the dude, so here I was virtually talking to him. I was like, yeah, you know, next time I'm in Seattle, I'll have to kind of meet up and that kind of thing. And he hasn't been here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Skipping um, Seattle. Oh my yeah. God. Hey, Ken, good to see you. So uh, Ken Puckett uh, just came into the chat. Say hi oh, to both awesome. of us. Another uh, alum from our kangaroo high school. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, so, my goodness. Yeah. I know for 89, we have our, whatever, 25th reunion. I saw something. That they're trying to plan something, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I've never I, been to a reunion. I have. I was just going to say, I haven't either for mine. Um, yeah. I don't. I don't even know if I even get anything if they found me some. You know, I, I, I get it for college. I don't necessarily get it for high school. Oh, do you? Okay. 
Yeah, um, I never graduated college, so <laughs> I got nothing. Yeah, and I'm kind of like, you know, my circle of friends back in high school, it was, it was very distinct. So I'm kind of like, for the most part, I know who those people are. And Ken's in here right now. So I mean, yeah. that's like, who would I go back to see that I really actually want to see? You're right. I can't think of too many. And I might be forgetting somebody. I'm spending a long time. But yeah. uh, for the most part, it's kind of like, eh. <laughs> you see him anyway, Steve or <laughs> yeah. what have you. Yeah, you see him from time to time. John most still, of the people. John still lives here in Edmonds and, you know, and. Um, John High, is that it? Yeah, 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 yeah. So that you know, the the nucleus of our our band thing that we had going on. And, yeah, <laughs> I mean, there's <laughs> there's a couple other people that I used to hang out with, but again, I mean, I, I hope they're doing well, but it's not, that's not going to get me back to a reunion. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but uh, and uh, yeah, I see Ken said he, he Ken did the ten year reunion, so he's not doing another. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the same thing. I mean, the people that we're friends with weren't in my same year per se. I mean, they were all, I think we all kind of cross pollinated or what have you. I mean, I mean, I came back to Seattle for a reunion per se for uh, Chad McCollum's 50th birthday. He was in Black Moses and we, uh, we played a, a show, <laughs> a little birthday show reunion, reunited Black Moses. And that was a few years ago, but I went and saw the people that I, but they weren't in my grade. They were like a couple years younger or something like that. Um, so, I mean, any of those reunions, they wouldn't be there, that type of thing. But yeah, the people that want to see, I'm obviously talking to or going to see or keeping in touch with otherwise. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I, I remember that show because, um, I was the job I had at the time, my muggle job, I was dis disinfecting for COVID. And yeah. so I had to be kind of careful about, and you were going to be flying on a plane. Oh, that's you know, right. I was going to try and come and drop something yeah, off with you. Yeah. yeah. So I was like, well, I can meet you like outside under like a porch or something, <laughs> but I, I really can't be like at the, at the show or, you know, some yeah, yeah, yeah. or bar. I just have to be kind of mindful of what I'm doing. So yeah, you ended up sending it. That's what I remember. Um, yeah, the, yeah. The gift. So and, yeah. And yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. Way. It was like, yeah, that was a cool, I mean, it was, yeah, it was right. It was right during the pandemic. It was such a weird time, but I wanted to be there and, Anyway, it worked out. It was just a quick in and out. Uh, but I got to see, you know, people that, you know, went to the high school, but just weren't part of that same whatever time period anyway. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'd see like, uh, and Ken's saying the same thing, you know, most, you know, the people he cares about from high school, he's still in touch with. I just heard from Kevin Hansen. And I know Kevin from way back. So and Kevin's, I think, is in Vegas, if I remember right. So, yeah, it's just like, yeah. <laughs> Especially, and that's that's one of the things where social media really works is that yeah. I may not be talking directly to Kevin, but we're friends on you know certain certain platforms, yeah. and I, we've messaged before, kind of busted. So especially when we find out yeah. I was doing all this stuff, well, Mark, I know so and so here in Vegas. Would you ever want to talk to him? I was like, yeah, I'd like to talk to him. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what a small small world at times. Um, oh yeah. And you know, oh yeah, I've got kids. I'm doing this, and I'm like, that's so crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I've mentioned this many times on these that anyone that knew me like yourself from you know back in high school, I already alluded to it earlier. It would have been really funny to them that I'm talking so much during right. you know, all these interviews because yeah. yeah. I, didn't, I didn't say shit back then. So no, <laughs> I mean, and I didn't either. I mean, I kept to myself and was like, uh, the "Guys, brooding or whatever." But you know, it's just <laughs> a different time. You know, it's whatever awkward. You didn't, you weren't part of the cool crowd, or I wasn't part of the cool crowd. It was just like. I did my thing and, you know, skated to school and kept to myself and had a few friends and that was it. Um, yeah, I, I was in I was in a similar boat. And I know Ken and uh, well, Steve was for sure, both of us and what well, John, too, that, you know, we were into metal, but then we were also good students. It was a way. Right. <laughs> it was, it was like, what's right? <laughs> we, we weren't the burnouts, you know, across the, the campus, you know, smoking yeah, yeah. cigarettes and doing whatever else they're doing over there. Right, right. Um, and I remember, I forget that kid's name, but he was sitting right in front of me in like my social studies class and God, he must've smoked pot every day. I mean, he just stunk <laughs> like pot every day. Um, you'd see his ass at some of the Colise you know, Seattle Coliseum shows and he's like, Hey, Mark. And it's like, <laughs> dude, <laughs> that's <laughs> funny. Give, give your brain a break. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, that's so funny. But yeah, it's really, really crazy. And, uh, Oh, and I see Ken saying that um, his 16-year-old son is working, oh, working on putting a band together. Cool, play oh, guitar. That's awesome. That's awesome, Heck Ken. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's cool. Definitely, once they get something, you know, recorded, you know, demo or whatever, it doesn't matter if it's just a rehearsal thing. I'd love to hear it. Yeah. Um, 
and I'm I'm sure you probably had some influence on what he listens to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, gosh. I know if I had kids, they'd be hearing all kinds of stuff around the house all the time, and they, they'd have no choice but to like some of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny. Some of my, you know, some of the music that my kids are into. I mean, it's like turned me on to some new stuff because I'm not going to remember the names of it. I'm telling you now, but. But yeah, and then they'll hear stuff and like, oh, dad, that's good. And they'll like listen to it. And so, I mean, we've definitely shared. They've definitely got their own taste and stuff like that. But it is cool seeing some of the stuff that they're they're into. And every once in a while, uh, uh, my son will play something for my wife. And she's like, oh, my gosh, this is something that I would listen to. This is awesome. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do your, um, I know they're at college, but like when your sons were at home, did they ever jam with you? Um, so it's been quite some time. Uh, they used to, I mean, uh, I used to get them down here in the studio and my son, one of them plays bass, the other one plays sax and piano. Um, but nowhere near as much as I wanted to. I mean, when I, when I made that first album, I got them to play on a couple of those songs. Um, and one of them helped me write a bass riff for one of them, but not as much I would have loved, you know, I would have loved like, you know, we were some family jam band, but we did off and on just nowhere near where I would have loved to, but those times, you know, obviously those are, those are awesome. So. Yeah. I, I'm thinking back to um, when uh, Wolfgang Van Halen toured with Van Halen, you know, with obviously Eddie being his father. Yeah. I can only imagine. I mean, as much as I was a fan of the original lineup and I want to see Michael Anthony there doing his thing. I totally understand why Eddie wants his son over there. Oh his. yeah. Heck yeah. <laughs> I, I totally, I totally get that. You're touring yeah. the world with your son. I mean, there's, there's really almost nothing better. Yeah. Um, so, and yeah, I see <laughs> Ken saying, yep, I showed him the ways of metal, you know, <laughs> for sure. And Scotty, Scotty has a drum question. Another one for you. Um, but yeah. he's, he's curious what sticks you play for live shows. And then the second part is, have you heard of a new company called Woody's Drumsticks? I have not. So I play, Vic Firth 5A, basically for everything, and these are whatever died. Um, and I play the same ones for live show, whether uh, or for practice. And then I started playing these Vic Firth Terra, which has got a different feel um, to them. Uh, it's a little bit heavier stick, but they're both 5As. Uh, basically for live show, <laughs> any stick, I keep sticks that start to crumble, and I use those for live show <laughs> because these make a mess in my studio. So I play the sticks until they start to splinter like this. And then I keep those for playing at live shows. And then I keep my fresh ones for playing inside the studio. So it doesn't have to vacuum as much. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's, that's, that's a practical musician. That's right. So yeah, so I tend to break a few sticks during live shows because I'm not using new <laughs> sticks. But, um, but it keeps my studio a little cleaner. So that's the only difference. But it's the same size for both 5As. Um, uh it's been a while since i've like tried different sizes or anything like that um uh anyway so yeah five a's two b's are like mont there's there tend to be monster sticks and like a lot of big rock drummers those tend to just be too big for me and then um anything smaller like a five b i think is a little bit what have you but um that one gives me enough the five a's give me enough power and um uh, enough speed and I like the balance of them. I used Mike Johnston sticks. I'm sure Scotty's used them a little bit because we got some. He makes his own stick. That's the guy that did the drum. That's the drum teacher uh, that we went to the drum camp with uh, in Folsom, California. Um, and uh, so I tried those for a little bit, but they're a little bit too light. Um, so these work out great. Okay, cool. And uh, I see Liberty Twitchers asking, um, what are some of the newer bands or artists you like? We kind of touched on this that we don't remember too many of them, but <laughs> but I don't know if anything else came to mind that you're that you're listening, even if it's not newer. Yeah, so there's um so there's a there's a lady called Kate Dutton. Um, she's a piano player. Um, I watch her uh, on her you know she's got a YouTube thing. Um, I like anything that's got you know like uh, some piano. Um, uh, a little bit of bass and you know other instruments i'm more into that type of stuff um I'm trying to think what else that i've listened to lately um there's a bunch of local bands you know that i'm i'm into there's uh you know you'd look them up in the atlanta area like there's triangle fire and los ojos muertos and um i mean there's bands that are like 
you know, you'd have to, you know, look them up. Uh, they do. They all have music out on like on Spotify and stuff like that. But there are a lot of local punk bands um, that I think are doing awesome. Um, but those are a couple of them. Um, but as far as like stuff that I'm, you know, I, I find old music like there's this one Torben unit um, I started listening to. But it's like an old like. I mean, it's probably from whatever late '90s and some sort of fusion thing going on and stuff like that. Um, Carter McLean, um, he's a drummer. He's the one that really inspired me to do my first album. Um, he puts out all these just drum albums. Um, you're not really going to find him on on uh, um, Spotify, but he has a site and he just all he does is he delivers it, uh, you know, physical media. That's all he makes, which is a cool concept to just stay out of the out of the uh, wormhole of Spotify or what have you. So, uh, but some of that stuff, I mean, a lot of instrumental stuff. Um, I went back and listened back to the other day, um, uh, a Beastie Boys <laughs> anthology uh, from a few years ago and just listened to some of that stuff. I mean, that's where, that was where my heart was when I first started was that type of raw, like what they were doing was just banging on instruments. It was nothing like real special about it. It's just, it had a groove, had some energy and I like that type of stuff. So, um, yeah. Cool. Um, got a couple other things to go through. Um, Scotty's saying to check out Woody's again, the, the drum okay. company. So check I'll check out Woody's. Out. All right. <laughs> and then Ken's asking, um, if you still jump out of airplanes. So it's been about 10 years since I've jumped out of the plane. Uh, so, you know, I have 6,000 plus jumps and that I did that for a while as a full-time instructor, but it's been about 10 years. There's an iFly, which is a indoor wind tunnel. And there's four of us. Uh, I go there every couple of weeks and I still fly in the wind tunnel. Um, so I, I was big into uh, formation skydiving, which is just four of us making different formations in the sky or what have you. It's a timed event. Um, so a group of those people that I used to do that type of uh, skydiving with, we still get together and that's much easier because I can go to the wind tunnel, <laughs> spend like an hour there. We do our stuff and then I can go home. Whereas like to go to a drop zone, you know, drop zones like an hour away, get all your gear, blah, 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 blah. It's an all day thing. And I'd rather spend my day making music at this point. So, um, or spending with my family. So I, the, uh, so yeah, Scott Ivan's kind of gone away. It's funny. You know, I used to say like, man, if you ever get bored of Scott Ivan, something's wrong with you. But, uh, I kind of did. <laughs> I kind of, you know, 6,000 jumps. I was just like, what am I doing here? I, I There's other stuff to do in life. It was freaking exciting. And uh, I mean, I would encourage anyone to at least try it once or twice. But um, um, there's also just, you know, something where to be said for like, you know, you got one life. There's so many things to do in life. And um, I mean, if you truly love it, then freaking do it for the rest of your life. But I mean, there's all to me, I'm more like, uh, I kind of picked and choose over the years of things that are really like go into deeply or what have you. Okay. And that you actually kind of already answered because, uh, Larry Twitcher had also asked about, uh, have you done more than 1000 jobs? And then she, uh, they followed up with, uh, have you had any malfunctions once you said 6,000 jumps? Yeah. I used to, <laughs> toward the end, I used to get, I used to really love having a malfunction. It was, it was something about it. Like, I think I was getting dangerous because I really loved, like, man, if I had a malfunction, man, it's like, all right, game on, man, let's get rid of this one, get on. Because I was, a, I was a, I'm a parachute rigger, I'm a, uh, you know, and I know the reserve is good, but there's something that, you know, to get more and more excitement out of a jump, the more jumps you make, man. Uh, yeah, I used to love malfunctions toward the end. I mean, which is, <laughs> it is what it is. But uh, yeah, those are fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm still a parachute rigger. Um, I'm actually the designated parachute rigger examiner for the for the Atlanta FISDO uh, Flight Service District Office for the FAA, and I test people to become parachute riggers. So um, I'm still, besides shooting star, I'm still involved in that part of it. And that's, um, uh, I have someone else who teaches that part. Again, I'm not a great, I don't really love teaching, but I'm, I'm the one that tests people out. So I'm the one that gives them their certificate if they pass the test. So I'm still involved in skydiving in that aspect, plus researching the gear, uh, figuring out what we're gonna, 
by articles and videos and stuff like that. Um, still big in that part of the sport, but I just don't actively jump. Okay. And I, I see Ken saying that uh, he, he wants to lose some weight so that he can try iFly uh, in the future. Yeah, iFly is, yeah, it's fun. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's the same because it's, it's, just, it's pretty much the same sensation other than you're just not, you know, five, 6,000 feet above the earth, but you're still, that's what skydiving feels like in the iFly tunnel. Okay, cool. And Liberty Twitcher followed up, I say, love malfunctions, oh my God. Uh, and then how many times did he have to pull his reserve chute? Uh, probably at least 15 or so, um, maybe 20, 15 to 20. Uh, but that's 6,000 jumps. That's about average, I guess. Something like that, yeah. So it's like, I think it's, I used to read something that was like once, I think the average was once every 333 jumps uh, was the average of a malfunction, at least at one point or what have you. And I think I was right in that window. Wow, that's, that's, that sounds good. <laughs> but I mean, a malfunction is, so you've got two parachutes, right? So, I mean, you know, uh, and it's when you, when you think of like, and we talked, I mean, not to get morbid, but, you know, people do die skydiving and that's part of, you know, part of it or what have you. And, um, but it wasn't from like having a malfunction usually. That's, people would do stupid things like under a great parachute, they crash into a car or a tree or they couldn't fly it right. Or there's so many other things that can happen than having just a, a malfunction and then, you know, having a malfunction on your main canopy and going to reserve. Um, that's not, you know, that's not usually how people get hurt or what have you. It's just part of skydiving. Okay. It's other ways. <laughs> <laughs> well, as we're getting closer to wrapping this up, I just have a, like a random question. Um, we kind of joked about this earlier. Maybe we did it before the show. Um, why did you cut your hair? So um, I, I wanted to, I wanted to change, but also I got to the point where I was starting to look at uh, hair donation. Um, and so I found this place called hair. We share because I mean, right now mine's like, it's been bleached and then it was purple for a while. Um, so it's not, but you can't really tell, but, um, uh, I'm like 50% gray or whatever, whatever. But <laughs> anyway, so finding a, uh, finding a place that would take gray hair, um, uh, the normal places don't take it, but I found this hair we share. So it was a way for me to donate my hair. Um, so. And I've I, over, I mean, I don't know if you remember, but from high school and Steve Walker would back this up. I mean, I went from like in high school, I went from like a crew, like a buzz cut to like growing it out to buzzing it off again. So over the years, I've done that a, a few times. Um, and uh, I think this is just another one of those times like, OK, well, OK, now I remember <laughs> the reason. So there's a couple of things I want to change. And when Sinead O'Connor died, um, it kind of struck me. Um, and I wanted to replicate what she had when she, uh, uh, as far as that haircut style, um, which I had done before. Um, so it was at that same time period that um, I was looking to do something different and that just kind of pushed me over the edge. And one day I was like, well, if I'm gonna do it, I wanna be able to give it away. Um, I'm doing it kind of in honor of Sinead O'Connor. And, um, and so I found a place to do it and then I just did it myself. I freaking figured out how to like, whatever, cut them in the things, whatever, send it off. Then I shaved it all. Um, and there's still a picture, I think, on my Facebook or well, maybe it's on my Instagram or whatever, my personal one, where of that cut of like just shaved off. And now I'm growing it out again. I've colored it a couple of times. I've, I've done purple. I'm actually going tomorrow to get a, uh, it's going to be all teal. Like if we would have talked tomorrow, my hair would be crazy. It's, uh, I've got this idea uh this cellist that i saw and i like her music too she's on instagram but i love her hair i saw her some npr thing anyway so i'm going for teal hair tomorrow okay cool yeah no i i i remember um i remember the purple and um i remember i don't know if they, if they still exist but there was a place an organization called locks for Lo locks for love or something that yeah hair donations to um so that that's good and i I mean, I haven't had, well, I don't have hair, but uh, <laughs> even back, you know, way back in high school, I still remember that I, I pushed off my hair for graduation. Um, 
that we did the rehearsal thing like in the afternoon and in between rehearsal and the actual graduation ceremony, that's when I went to the stylist and got it all pushed off. Yeah. And so that when people saw me, they're kind of like, what, what, what the hell happened to your hair? What, I looked so different at that point. Um, and you know this, since you've gotten, you've had long hair and then didn't you have, didn't that, you know, the weight off your neck and everything, yeah. when that hair is gone, it's really nice. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's, yeah, it, it's just definitely a lot to take care of. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I think one of the times I had to cut it and it was pretty damn long when I was in Seattle is when I got a job at Coca-Cola as a merchandiser and they required you to have that. And I was like, oh. so I went to like in Fred Meyer, one of those like super cuts, great clips or whatever. And it was like it was down to my butt. And and I said, I just need this has to be all chopped off. And she, I mean, she about lost it. It's like, I can't do this. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> it has to be done. But uh yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's just, you know, uh, but yeah, that was the thing was I wanted to donate it. The Sinead O'Connor uh, passing away and that all came to fruition. And now I'm, I'm actually trying to grow it out again. Um, but at, along the way, because that in-between period, that's the period I hate you know, where it's like <laughs> it's like it's all weird and whatever, at least for me. And I'm sure a lot of people like that. Uh, I want to grow it. I think I can grow it out again, but um, I'm I just got into coloring it. So I've been doing that every so often. So yeah, tomorrow teal. Okay. Well, and Susan's saying we need to see pics of this new hair color. Oh yeah, heck yeah, it'll be out there. <laughs> uh, and yeah. That, and that in between part, I know what you're talking about. That's when you look like Bozo the Clown. I mean, it's kind yeah, of like, yeah. It's not where it needs to be with the weight, but it's like in this middle part. It's like oh, it's like yeah, yeah. you want it to grow fast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So and my wife's been supportive. So she's like, whatever you want to do. So yeah, just to walk well, around. Well, yeah. the, the other thing is at least you get options. I mean, you have hair one yeah. and then two, you can do different things with it. Yeah. You know, yeah. With me, I have to wear a wig or whatever, I guess. I mean, <laughs> yeah, so far, um, I mean, it's thinning in places, but so far it's still all there. So I got a little bit of time. Scotty's saying you need to rock a mohawk, dude. <laughs> yeah 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 oh that's funny oh my goodness uh, and i you know i've said that i think two other times before we wrap this up <laughs> um did you ever get a chance to see Sinead play live perform live not that i remember <laughs> i can't remember all the freaking shows i went to i okay. you know but i don't remember um it's funny there's a couple people uh Chad McCollum's brother, Rick McCollum, sometimes will remind me of a show that we went to at like the community theater or whatever. And uh, I'm like, really? <laughs> we saw who? Really? Okay. But uh, I don't remember ever seeing her live. And of course, you know, you know, just all the stuff that, you know, you go back and watch some of the videos and stuff like that. But I did read her book and um, which was awesome. It, it changed my view of Prince. You know, I was looked up to Prince, but she's got a chapter in there that kind of burst that bubble so what have you <laughs> okay yeah i i ended up seeing her right before the pandemic it was january oh, 2020 you? yeah i saw her here i covered the show oh man i think when i was yeah i think when i was looking up something i saw something that you had okay that's awesome yeah she she played the neptune and it was actually where i met another photographer for the first time lisa she sat down next to me and at least she was being nice because she introduced herself. I was kind of like, <laughs> <laughs> just didn't want to be bothered that day for whatever reason. And um, yeah. she she came on and did live stream interviews with me. I see her at shows and all that kind of thing. But yeah, I got a chance to see Sinead, uh, you know, before her, her untimely passing. And um, it was it was so, I don't even know how to describe that show because I was not like a huge fan of her, her songs. I didn't know her catalog or whatever. Yeah. Um, I had not seen the documentary. I actually reviewed the documentary later once that came out. Yeah. And, um, but you just felt like you're seeing somebody that wasn't of this earth when mm. she performed. I mean, it was just so like worldly, I guess maybe might be the right word for it. Yeah. Um, and you got completely sucked into what she was doing. I mean, I didn't, you know, what half the song she did, but you're just kind of like into her world. You just got sucked into it. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was an amazing, I was so glad that I, I chased after that show to get credentialed for it because it, it awesome. took, it took some hoops to jump through because I think Lisa and I were the only ones that got approved. Wow, um, for that show. So I'm like, wow. oh, that's that's awesome. So I think that's why maybe I was a little bit bummed to be completely honest. I thought I was the only one there that got approved, and then she showed up like five minutes before the set, <laughs> and I'm like, God damn it! <laughs> that's funny. 
Oh, um, gosh. And, and Lisa's like one of the, the loveliest people you could ever meet. So Lisa, if you're watching this, I'm not saying anything bad about you. I was just yeah. being a self, self-centered self jerk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, and comes I out the best of us. <laughs> yeah, I did at that point. Little did I know what's coming around the corner. Good grief. Um, and uh, oh, Ken says that he has uh, an Excel um, like file of all the shows that he's been to. It's been over oh, wow. over, two, over 250 since 1984. Wow. wow. Yeah. I, I, I had a, I had a sheet too at one point and I don't know when I stopped adding to it, but it just became like too much. <laughs> so I stopped. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I do keep like, especially when I'm credentialed because a lot of times they still give me physical tickets, which I love. Yeah. Um, I throw them into this drawer. <laughs> so, <laughs> there you go. They're all sitting there. At some point, I'll just take them all out, throw them on the floor, and take a picture of it, throw it on my Instagram or whatever. So people are like, "Christ, man, look at all that yeah. shit you've been to." And these are not just concerts, obviously. They're you know theater and opera and ballet stuff and everything musicals. But it's just like, no, I still like kind of seeing that. I still have my the ticket stubs that I kept through at least through the '80s. I still have those things in a yeah a little like a baseball card thing where you put those in instead of putting baseball cards. I put my ticket stubs in it. There you um, go. So it's like, but yeah, at one point, just like, no, this is just too much. I don't like it. Yeah. I've started, like, I keep all, you know, every once in a while, I'll, I've run across, like, an old show flyer, you know, from one of my old bands or whatever. But I used to never keep that. I was like, oh, that's cool, whatever, you know, at the time. But it's a little different, <laughs> I guess, as you get older. So now every freaking flyer is up, up, you know, in the studio. I keep them all. I make sure and everyone in our band knows that I want the, you know, the flyer because I'm just, you know. They're not as all, I mean, some of them keep, if they like the flyer, but I'll take every flyer. So every show that we've played, I mean, I make sure I get the show flyer. It's so rare that they're printed these days anyway. I mean, a lot of the, you know, fly, when someone says, oh, they put a flyer up, it's just like a little Instagram thing. But um, a lot of these shows still have at least one or two printed flyers at the, at the venue or whatever. And I always make sure I take that on my way, <laughs> on my way out. So I always keep those. That's cool. When I played in my duos, I did the exact same thing. It's like, yeah. I, I, want, I want that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think, so I moved uh, a little over two years ago. I, I don't know if I kept those. I had a downsize, so a bunch of stuff, unfortunately, had to find its way to the dumpster. And I think those things may have gone to the dumpster. I'm not positive. But yeah, at one point, every fucking show, I yeah. wanted that. <laughs> um, I didn't care if we're playing in a brewery or at a you know farmer's market. I mean, I right. wanted there. Exactly. I saw something, and our, our names on I want that thing. Yeah. Um, absolutely and i was still a, it's when we were playing this is like at least what six seven years ago now um no seven or eight years ago um i wanted like footage of us because it's like you know i didn't do anything with it nobody ever saw it i just wanted to yeah. have it in case i wanted to even if it's just for reference man there's that new that new cover song we did well you kind of messed up that part that didn't sound very good because when yeah. you're playing it and what the mm -hmm. audience is hearing it's off these two different things and because I had some other uh, friends that played music, and they're like, why do you always have, like, your, my mom used to do, she would be there with her, her camera or whatever, filming stuff. So why do you have your mom do that? So because of that. So I want it as, like, a memento. I want it as a reference tool. I want some other thing. And even if for some weird reason we blow up and get huge, when you do the big, long documentary, I need that, <laughs> I need that footage. Yeah. Here we yeah. were back in 2015, and, you know, playing in this coffee shop. And <laughs> that kind of shit. Absolutely. But I that that is a key. I mean, especially, uh, especially now, every freaking show we play, and a lot of the practices, some of the other members record it, but definitely the shows. I'm always, even if it's not something I post, I'm taking a, uh, I'm getting an audio or a video of it because yeah, I'll go back and listen because there's still crap. I mean, dude, it's a lifetime thing of like, oh crap, I'm still rushing that chorus or, damn, it's like, uh, you know, I could have pulled back there or, uh, or I could have hit, you know, whatever, filled that in better or what have you. Usually it's a speed thing. Like, holy crap, I kicked off that song too fast, and like, so then I'm thinking about that the next show. Like, okay, I'll make sure I bring this one in. Or whatever and it's just you know you want you want to get better and having that to listen back to i mean my you know my show day uh, when we do shows which is pretty much every other weekend it seems like or whatever um you know i'm doing three to four shows a month every show i get back from the show and and i might get back at midnight but I'll, i'm sitting there at the kitchen table playing back i'm not you don't go to bed till like two in the morning because i want to listen back to the show I was like, okay, I did nail that one this time or whatever. It's just, you know, one of those things, just a, a learning process. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I, it's I invaluable. Totally, yeah. I, I, I totally get it. It's just like, no, it's again, if, if it's something that I only use for myself, 
yeah then that that's that's value just in that you know by itself yeah. um i also had to kind of remember sometimes of like what went over well in between songs because of my, just my singer and myself so sometimes i might have said something that was kind of funny or something that was engaging i got to yeah. remember that for the next show because <laughs> <laughs> uh, we we're just saying shit off the top of our heads so who knows come on especially if i had like four beers after you know jesus christ um <laughs> And, and my, my senior definitely had a, a, a peculiar sense of humor. So sometimes things would be completely flat of what was said. So I'm like, oh, we better not say that again. <laughs> yeah. That did not go over. <laughs> yeah, that, that was a bomb all right there. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, we just kind of, you know, you, you read the room and you just kind of, and also like if things are not working well musically and then people are kind of into what you're doing, it's pretty easy no matter what you do. But then, yes, yeah, so then you have those kind of tough shows like that just not coming to you. Right. Um, and the band, and you know, the people that are there, I still remember we played one show where we we're in, it was an actual establishment, but we started early, like maybe at six or something is when we started our set. And, um, there was literally two ladies out on this deck cause it was a nice day. And yeah. so we're in here, they're out there. And my singer was like, she was really bummed. She's like, Mark, there's nobody here. I said, well, no, you know, it's early. You know, people are still working on that kind of thing. We'll have some yeah. people start showing up and sure enough, they did like about 30 minutes into the set or whatever. Some people started showing up, but we did the song Roxanne and I still remember this because nobody else was there yet. Just those, those two ladies out there. And when we finished, you hear this. And, um, the lady said, that's her name, Roxanne. <laughs> 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 We're like, so I was like, see, we did something right. We, we have Roxanne right here. And that's why we played that. Well, you want to hear it again? <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah i mean how lucky was that <laughs> yeah no that's awesome um and yeah. i see ken, ken saying he'll never get rid of his cassettes that we made in high school he's probably saying that to me he's also talking about the tapes he has of you mike yeah. um so yeah i mean I, I if i had kept everything that i've ever bought over the years you know music and films and all that i wouldn't be able to live in this apartment that i'm in i mean i would have so much shit. um yeah. I've, I've thinned my my collection definitely over the years for various reasons and now it's super small just because of the place I'm in, I just, I refuse to put it in a box and put it into a storage shed. Yeah. Um, but I do miss, there's definitely times where I'm like, man, I wish I could go grab that album. That, oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah. I lost so much vinyl. That was, I, I think, I don't know what happened. I think I ended up leaving it when I left Seattle with the old girlfriend. And I don't think I'm, I'll never see that again, but yeah, I started recreate, recreating my vinyl. The only thing I kept were my seven inches, um, I've got a whole stack of seven punk seven inches. Um, and that was like the only thing that for some reason I kept that, but I had so much 12 inch vinyl and like, I, uh, yeah, that got left in Seattle. I'm sure I got dumped. We all have stories. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we all do. Um, I had sold a lot of stuff on eBay when I needed money. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and especially when I, especially like when I found like vintage t-shirts were getting a lot of money, I was like, Oh, this stuff's worth that much. So I'm like, okay, I got a bunch of it, you know, <laughs> like I got the ticket stuff, ticket stuff to prove that I actually was there at that show. That yeah. Um, but yeah, there's, there's been definitely times of certain things. I'm like, yeah, that's one thing I probably shouldn't have gotten rid of, yeah. but too late now. Yeah. I did keep a lot of like, and yeah, I've over the years, I've also paired out or lost stuff, but, I did keep any of like our four track recordings or something like that. Um, uh, you know, I kept some of those and I've gone back a little bit and listened to some of those from time to time from some of the bands of stuff that never got released or what have you. Um, there's a band uh, actually 420 Love and I had some four track recordings. I still keep up with the bass player from that band who's now in Miami. Um, and actually we've talked about putting something together. I want to do a funk record. That's my next solo thing. I want to do a funk record, just funk rhythms. It's just another instrumental, but all funk stuff. And the, the bass player that used to be with me, Blake, uh, in 420 Love, was such a funky bass player. And um, anyway, long story short, we've been talking a little bit back and forth, but he wants to hear all the old 420 Love stuff. So I got to get that digitized, at least to send him. It's nothing we've ever put out. It's just all four track recording stuff from practices. But anyway. Yeah, I still have that. <laughs> wow, it so sounds like, you know, at some point, like we were talking earlier that um, if it's five years, if it's 10, 15 years down the road, you could put together, even if just for yourself, this huge, like, you know, box set of yeah. like, rare unreleased recordings and things yeah. of the various bands and projects you've been a part of. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's fun to go back and listen to it and stuff like that. Um, 
Yeah, for sure. So yeah, you could make it a limited edition one of one. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. Sign oh, sign the number to yourself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh my well, gosh. Everybody in the chat, thank you so much for joining us. I yes, love thank you. In the chat and commenting and again, yes, one, appreciate you. It's one drummer drumming. It's Red Hot Empty, um, Eclectic Arts Media. Mike, as always, it's been a pleasure. Great catching up with you and seeing what you're going, you got going on. You got a lot going on, which is awesome. Yes, having fun. Thank you. And appreciate you having me. Um, yeah, I just love watching and following up with you. I mean, ever since we kind of reconnected and saw what you were doing, I mean, um, yeah love being a part of this and hopefully it was interesting to people out there and yeah thanks for everyone that watched and came into the chat and for you taking the time to to talk with me it was awesome thank you mark yeah no, thank you mike i mean it's going to be something that uh i'll definitely be able to keep you in mind last year i think i only did four fun tables and the year before that i did one but um you know getting you connected with some other artists that i'm especially if they're new people that are kind of come across my path um, yeah uh, it's all fair game is the way I look at it. I was kind of mindful of like, well, I had this person for three times and this person I've never had. Now right. it's like, now it doesn't matter. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> <laughs> I want to find people that'll get along well and we, yeah, some good fun times. So, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Thanks, Susan. She, she's saying great show. Thanks to you both. Ken, always good to see you. Saying, saying it's good yes, to see both of us. And, um, and anyway, again, anyone else that's watching and uh, before we go, I don't, we were talking a little bit about, um, you were talking about the final four and how it made you feel with your performance and, and that kind of oh, thing. Yeah. Um, do you have a pick in the championship game, which it may be starting any minute now? So I was watching all the women's. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so am I. So, so am I. I don't know. I didn't watch any of the men's. I haven't kept up with the men's. Oh my gosh. It was like, yeah. So I couldn't tell you, I couldn't even tell you who's in it because I was so involved, invested in the women. So, <laughs> see, you're like me because I, I was like, um, a courtside season ticket holder for like 10 years with a storm. So okay. that's why I follow the women's game and especially obviously with Caitlin Clark and everything else going on and Don Staley. Um, yeah. It's like, there's so much more about that. The men's it's UConn and Purdue and they're both number one seeds that are playing tonight. So, and I think UConn's favorite is my understanding, but I watched part of their games two days ago when they got in the final four to see to get to not, tonight's game. And um, well, I'll have I, to go watch it. Uh, <laughs> you know, if I got to pick one, I'll just say UConn, but yeah, I need to go. I need to, that'd probably be good to go watch tonight. So maybe I'll go do that. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll probably try to catch some of it. But yeah, that for me it was like, well, the women's thing happened, so now this is like somewhat lesser. <laughs> <laughs> it is, and that's a good thing. I mean, it's yeah, it's awesome seeing that like I don't know shift for sure. I mean, that's awesome. Yeah, and I know the national media made a really good point, which I didn't think about, is that with the women's college game for the March Madness, you're talking about players, and then with the men, you're talking about teams. In terms of the mm. schools and which is typical you don't really think of i mean there's going to be some stand-up players don't get me wrong on the men's side but with the women look what's happened i mean yeah people know these ladies from these right. teams and then some of them are now going to be going to the WNBA draft later this month and that means that league is going to get that much better in terms of the yeah. quality of players and there are already some amazing athletes in that league but now it's going to be like jesus yeah. um if you're like an average player you're not going to make that league i mean yeah. it's not you're going to be going overseas is what you're going to be doing yeah. Um, but that's great for the, you know, the fans to get a chance to go see them. So, uh, Caitlin's supposed to hopefully get drafted by Indiana. Um, and so when they play Seattle, which will be one time this season, there's gonna be a bunch of people at that game strictly because she's there. And I know yeah. I'll be, I'll be one of them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's it's so great for the sport. I mean, it's so great. It's just, and for women in general, it's just, man, how awesome is that? It is. Yeah. I, I couldn't be happier for them. And I also think you know, if we're talking about this really quickly, that, um, um, for me, Coach Don Staley has been one of the best examples of how to be a coach, how to be a leader, how to have class. Yeah. Um, and she's as real as it gets. Um, so, uh, but she <laughs> yeah. still recognizes like what other people are doing for their sport. Um, yeah. And I still remember that there's a, a, a post game conference when one of her players said, "Nobody can guard us. Nobody can guard us." And then she chimed in and said, "We gave up a 22 point lead <laughs> and just shut, <laughs> just shut her up." Yeah, yeah. Um, it's like that. Yeah, don't get cocky. You know, yeah. we got we got more games to win to get, to, and obviously they, they did it. But still, yeah. um, tr tremendous tremendous things that they're doing, and really good role models for everybody. Yeah, no, they're after. I mean, after the um, her interviews and comments after uh, last night were awesome as well. So yeah, yeah, and she even went out. I, I just read that um, after they're in the locker room celebrating like for an hour, she went back out to the local media and did interviews one on one, which is completely almost unheard of 
Yeah. Uh, when teams win championships, they're done. They're celebrating this. <laughs> yeah. They're going to talk to the big, the, the big dogs of media. And then if you're a local person, they're not going to talk to you. And she went back out and talked yeah. to all of them. So I was like, damn. Yeah. Wish I was there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. I don't do sports stuff. I do entertainment yeah. and art stuff, but maybe I need to think about that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Branch out. Branch out. <laughs> all right. Well, have a great, right. great night, Mike. Thanks right. again. And hopefully I get a chance to see you soon. Sounds good. Thank you, right. Mark. Take All care. Right, take it easy. See you.